Yeah. We can cut this out for the YouTube. Can we should I start again? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the University of Buckingham. I'm the Vice Chancellor, Professor James Tooley, and I'm welcoming you on this beautiful summer's morning to our verdant campus at Buckingham. The University of Buckingham, as you know, is this free, independent, academic, free-thinking university, and we are really proud to be hosting today our very own Institute of International Monetary Research seminar. The seminar is entitled The Impact of New Means of Payments on the International Monetary System and Monetary Policy. The, I'm speaking in the Vincent Auditorium, part of the Vincent Building, which was opened some three years ago, and this hosts the Vincent Center for Public Understanding of Economics and Entrepreneurship. And within that center now is, uh, is placed the Institute of International Monetary Research. It's been with us in the university since 2014, and we're really proud of our association and our, our collaboration to date. The seminar today, um, in a moment, I'll be introducing you to the director of the IIMR, Dr. Juan Castaneda. But in our first session, we've got David Birch from 15 Megabyte Limited. He'll focus on the current implementation of new digital currencies. Diego Zuluega from Fingleton will assess how these new currencies are being regulated and our very own Brandon Davis from the University of Buckingham will discuss the impact of new digital currencies on payment systems, both national and international. Then we have a second session this afternoon. Jason Allen from Humboldt University will discuss the nature of central bank money. And Kevin Dowd from Durham University will assess the impact of central bank digital currencies on monetary competition. This session, this conference is timely, it's topical, and I commend it to you. I want now to hand over to our very own Dr. Juan Castaneda, Director of the Institute of International Monetary Research, who will take you through further and introduce you to the chair and speakers. Dr. Juan Castaneda, thank you. Well, thank you very much, James, for your very warm uh, welcome to, to the event. It is a pleasure to be here, to be hosted by the University of Buckingham and by the, the Vincent Center. So just a few words uh, before we start with session one, just to introduce the, the Institute of International Monetary Research. The Institute is an educational charity, as James said, uh, was set up in uh, 2014 in association with the University of Buckingham. And we are based here in, uh, uh, in our campus in Buckingham. Uh, the Institute of International Monetary Research uh, demonstrates and brings to, to public attention the strong relationship between the quantity of money uh, on the one hand and the levels of national income and expenditure on the other. We study uh, how the, the changes in the amount of money broadly defined uh, affect uh, prices, both asset prices and CPI prices, as well as nominal income along, along the cycle. But today is much more about uh, our focus is going to be about a much more new means of payments and uh, the impact of new means of payments on international monetary system and monetary policy. And we have an excellent panelist uh, uh, coming forward later today. I may introduce uh, the, the chairperson of the first uh, session, uh, Chris Ostrovsky from Onfith. Chris is the chief revenue officer of Onfith, a central bank think tank based in London and managing director of the Digital Monetary Institute, the world's uh, leading independent platform for convening central banks on CBDC, central bank digital currencies, digital payments, the DLT, and blockchain. Uh, Chris previously worked in financial uh, publishing for Incisive Media, Euro Money, Institutional Investor, where he set up inter international investment conferences all over the world, uh, working extensively in Russia, uh, Southern Europe, and across Asia. Uh, he studied at the University of East Anglia, and the IE Business School in Madrid, where he's now a visiting lecturer on financial markets and business ethics. So Chris, if you may, please, the floor is yours. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Juan. Thank you, James. Um, thank you for the warm introduction at OMFIF, um, where we're a central bank uh, think tank based in London of 10 years standing. We're delighted to have this relationship with the Institute of International Monetary Research and the University of Buckingham. There's lots of shared interest and there's lots of combined areas of research that OMFIF and the IIRM uh, research together. Um, this is my first in-person conference for 18 months, and it's delightful to, to be here with um, other people here in the audience, and a warm welcome to everyone watching this online as well. The Digital Monetary Institute, which um, Juan mentioned, is uh, something that uh, we launched in OMFIF uh, at the beginning of uh, the middle of last year, really. It's about 18 months old now, and the acceleration of interest has been absolutely phenomenal. Central banks have for many years not really had to think about uh, threats to their existence or other means of payments or private currencies. And suddenly we've seen a huge change in this in the last 18 months or so. There are really three things that have driven the change. The first is the fact that China very much has a first mover advantage. The PBOC experiment has um, certainly had some successes and that has been noted and so other central banks have had to respond. The second driver has been the rise of Bitcoin, perhaps not particularly successful as a means of payment, but certainly it's never out of the news and it's forced central banks to take note. And thirdly, the use of and the entry of big tech, particularly the Libra DM group into the currency space and the payment space, mainly through remittances. And these three things have certainly made central banks far more eager to learn more, more eager to talk to technology companies, more eager to find out what the payment options are. It is also true that very noble aims like financial inclusion and enhancing the digital economy are also part of the central bank's um, objectives in pursuing these this, this uh, further interest in digital currencies and digital payments. And in this first session now, we're going to look at um, the new payment systems and the role of um, uh, money in the international currency system. So, and this is absolutely crucial in how monetary policy is set and the link between that and payments. So James introduced Brandon, Diego, and David previously. Please do ask questions in the chat function. Please also um, uh, make sure that you uh, uh, get in touch if you've got any questions about what's said or what's in any of the presentations. And there'll be a Q&A after the three speakers have made their presentations, which I will be moderating. And we look forward to having a lively debate after the presentations. But first of all, I would like to introduce Brandon Davis um, from this institute, the IIMR, to come and make his presentation. Brandon, over to you. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, camera's over there, yeah? Oh, camera's over there. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, let me see if I can pull up a first slide just to make sure things work. Am I going the right way? Use the down button. We're there. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and it's a delight to be here. Um, like so many other people, I suspect, on, on this, this, um, on this conference. This is the first time I've been in front of an audience, I think for the best part of 18 months, or a live audience anyway, and though limited, at least it's a, an improvement on where we have been. Um, this, this talk, uh, Money in the 21st Century, um, is actually in some ways not the talk I'm going to give you, um, because it started out about 18 months ago, um, and it was the last talk that I gave uh, to a conference in, in the city. And um, it started a, a whole string of, of other uh, papers and, and uh, lectures all, all done online um, on payments, on quantitative easing, on trade finance, and on national payment systems. And, um, and therefore the subjects have become incredibly broad, which is something that I think we're all beginning to appreciate about the scale of the, roof, uh, of the revolution that we are, we're in because money in the 21st century is not going to be like money in the 20th. Um, so I can obviously bore for Britain on the subject if we got through all that in detail, uh, but what I've decided to do is something a little different. Um, uh, but I guess for this, any students in the audience, and there will be some, um, let me say that there's a thousand and one PhDs to be written on this subject as well. Um, but in order not to bore you, but uh, hopefully indeed that, um, uh, we'll all enjoy the discussion uh, today. Um, I'm going to simply um, focus that discussion on four major points that have come out of a lot of the work that I've done. 
um, because I believe that this is a very profound revolution. And these points are central uh, to how that revolution will evolve because money isn't going to flow through the system quite as it has before. Um, there was a revolution before, and I will contrast that this with that revolution, and that was the revolution in the late 17th, early 18th century with the creation of paper money. Um, what I'm extremely hopeful of is that in this revolution, we don't end up in the, in the same place that we did then. Uh, because um, what it led to uh, was um, the South Sea bubble, uh, the Darien scheme, and, uh, and the Mississippi Company. And uh, for any of you who study uh, economic history, you'll know that these were, um, these were <laughs> groundbreaking, but uh, literally groundbreaking schemes. Um, one broke a, a country, Scotland. Uh, the other one broke a country, France. And, um, and the other one nearly broke the UK or England as it was in, in those days. Um, and uh, it is also interestingly that it does involve one of my favorite economists. So again, for all you students out there, um, please read about John Law. If you think economists are boring, that's the last thing he was. Um, and I, and I do, I, I've got some laughs. I do recommend his, uh, his biography there. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a fun read. Um, anyway, um, so why do I say this is a revolution? Well, um, I haven't got a crystal ball and uh, you know, the future is not unknown, it's unknowable, but, um, but I think it's pretty well, um, I think it's pretty well a good bet. Um, the most important feature, he says, the most important feature of any monetary system uh, is the ability to allow citizens to make payments, um, mainly because that's how we get stuff. Um, consumption is 70% of GDP in almost all developed economies. Um, and so uh, the main feature of any monetary system must be this ability to improve our ability to get stuff. And digitization of payments, I suggest, is doing exactly that. Um, if we look, uh, uh, if we look at the scope of what's going on today, uh, literally, um, what happened when we you know, couldn't go to the shops, or barely, when few, well, very few banks were open, and when you effectively couldn't leave your house? Well, um, if you have child tried that on anybody 50 years ago, they would tell you the economy would collapse, but it did not. Um, you don't need a high street, you just need a marketplace app. Um, Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, Tencent, and a payments app. So PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, so developing in that way, uh, Alipay and, and Tempay, both of which are rather more advanced systems. Um, but we are already to some extent uh, in the, um, in the uh, 21st uh, century version of, um, of digital money, uh, but only to some extent. We can pay for goods and services uh, easily enough in a shop, we've been able to do that with cards for ages, um, we begin to, to be able to do it at much lower cost, and we're being able to do it more in terms of paying also for our plumber, our electrician, our friend, our gambling creditors, for any of you who are John Law, um, uh, uh, know anything about John Law, uh, you know, that was something he should have taken notice of. Um, uh, these are peer-to-peer -peer -peer payment apps, and uh, that's a significant advance. Um, you don't need a card, you just need a phone. And, um, and Alipay and Tempay in, in China are peer-to-peer -peer systems. Um, you can even use quick response codes to do so. And this is becoming, there are systems available in the West now that do exist exactly this. So whether they take over from, uh, um, whether they take over from Visa and MasterCard's structure, which is a very different kind of structure, um, will be interesting. Uh, I suspect so because the, the Visa and MasterCard system is inherently quite expensive to run. Um, but this is, comes to our first point. Um, what do banks look like in a digital world? Um, are, we in the age of, are we in the age of FinTech or are we really in the age of tech fin? What do I mean by that? Well, if you look um, specifically at how banks operate in a, in a digitized world, um, basically it's a string of apps. Um, that you store wealth on and make payments from. 
Um, think about Alibaba, it was, it is, until the regulators uh, started to get very concerned about it. Um, it was the uh, biggest money market fund in China. It was the biggest consumer lending organization in China, which really caused quite a stir. Um, it had already been, I think, the biggest or second biggest marketplace app it and Tencent are very close to one another, um, social media app and uh, a payments app. So basically, these are lifestyle apps, and that's something that we haven't really seen uh, in the West yet, but they are, um, they are being developed. But uh, whether the regulators here um, curb them before that happens, I think is possibly on the cards. Um, the whole thing runs on data. I mean, that is the thing to, oops, sorry, wrong way, wrong way. That's the thing to remember about this. Everything runs on data. Um, and, uh, and data is uh, what will, it's what the banking system has always used because it does credit appraisal using your bank account. But credit appraisal has gone far beyond that now. And looking at your payments is much more interesting in the sense than looking at your income. Uh, bank data these days also has to be shared uh, because if you, um, if, you, if you hold an account and you ask, uh, uh, you designate a, an ag aggregator to take that data and help you manage your affairs with it, that's, that, that data then becomes uh, as open to the aggregator as it was to the bank. But the other issue that we sometimes miss, I think, is that bank data is getting less and less. Um, look at your Barclay card statement or your MasterCard statement. And what it'll say is Amazon, Amazon, Ali, well, sometimes Alipay. It does work in the UK, Alipay, um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, eBay, eBay. It's not telling the bank anything like what it used to tell it. So basically, banks are less able in that world to look at data. Um, and I think, therefore, that that world is going to become quite a strain on the banking system. And the banking system certainly could operate through, um, through uh, a whole string of apps on different companies, um, provided by different companies. Now, if we look uh, at... Uh, so my next major point, it is, what is the privacy statement? Sorry, what happened there? Is the role of state, what is the role of the state in the creation of money? Um, the state has a monopoly on the creation of money in the current world. Um, or at least government money, CBDC, C is central bank money. Um, and in the 21st century, are these new currencies that are private currencies, like Bitcoin, are they going to become useful to us or are they going to become the 21st century version of the South Sea bubble? And I think that's an interesting discussion point because I don't know the answer. Um, again, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, um, but it's an interesting point because stable coins are starting to become uh, an issue with central banks. And I think for very good reason. Uh, most of those stable coins I have to say today is extremely opaque to understand quite what the backing of that coin is. They say it's a US dollar or could be a pound sterling. Uh, but I think if it's going to replace public money, it, that link is going to have to be much more um, one which reflects the way in which the bank works today. Now, there is actually nothing to stop uh, a, fin a, finance, a, a fintech or tech fin um, holding reserve balances at Bank of England or with any other central bank. Well, actually with the Bank of England at the moment, because the Bank of England does allow non-banks to hold, res hold reserve balances. A number of other central banks don't. Um, but you could imagine a world where the creation of money actually came from a monetary base still controlled by a central bank. And, um, and that, I think, is, is where we are likely to be heading. Um, so uh, can they effectively take base money and turn it into broad money? Well, I think they can. I mean, that's, that was the whole issue about Alibaba. 
in a sense, was that Alipay was beginning to operate um, very much as a bank, even though um, it might have had might have had something but banking license, but uh, not a full banking license. Um, so that I think is where it's possible to go. I have to say I'm somewhat skeptical that's where we're going to go. Why? Well, I think um, banks, central banks are very conservative institutions. Um, they don't like the idea of other people printing money. Um, I think they've got too used to it. You could say, well, it won't make that much difference if you control the money base, but I think they think it does. I think more than that, um, they would actually have a vested interest in preserving the current banking system, mainly because of its regulation. Um, banks are really fairly easy, fairly easy uh, to control. Um, they also need citizens to have access to central bank digital currencies if they're created. And the obvious way of doing that is through a central bank wallet. But that wallet is going to be very difficult to administer if you administer it directly from a central bank. So would they use the banking system as the way of creating the wallets and then allowing the system to transfer money between them? And I think that's highly likely. Um, I'm going to skip two. Um, yeah. So I think also that it preserves the ability of central banks if they keep the monetary system within the, um, the, the, the commercial banking system. It preserves the capacity of central banks to operate um, central bank policies such as. Um, macro policy tools such as um, uh, such as helicopter money or negative interest rates and it preserves that capability through institutions they know and trust or at least reasonably trust whereas I have to say having served on the board of a couple of fintechs um, or maybe tech fins they were but whichever um, any discussion about regulation usually met an extremely blank stare from across the um, across the other side of the board table um, and I remember having one discussion uh, at one where I had to explain what regulation was uh, because they seriously, I, I was facing three board directors, all of whom were tech guys uh, and half my age, in fact, less than half my age. And they brought me in to sort of try and, because they were getting a bit of flack from the central bank and uh, to try and understand um, what regulation was. And, and uh, the whole, whole idea didn't, didn't really gel at all which was quite interesting. Um, but it does, so with central banks, yes, we are going to, um, sorry, with, um, with the development of digital currencies and CBDCs, we are, I think, going to need to reform the banking system, but I suspect it's not going to fundamentally change as fast as uh, some people think, uh, mainly because I think that the, preservation of a regulatory system is something that the, the central banks value enormously. And I think it will be very difficult for them to trust fintechs or tech fins uh, in the same way. So you've got a mass of regulation these days around this. You've got KYC, AML, K, know your customer, AML, anti-money laundering, PEP, politically exposed persons, um, suspicious activity reporting, a quarter of a million of those reports go in every year. It's a huge industry, and that needs to be um, looked at. Um, and this brings me to what I think is the biggest point I've, I have uh, in this whole talk, the biggest point I've ever come across, I think, in this, is what is the privacy relationship between the citizen and the state? Um, basically, if you use... Um, if you use a, uh, a blockchain and that blockchain is a permission blockchain, and I think the likelihood of it being an, uh, a non-permission blockchain is about zero, um, permission this is just not going to gel with, with, with central banks, then your problem is, well, you create, in a sense, the ultimate surveillance state. 
because because you know um oh, my battery's gone dead um you know uh the um you know the relationship uh, between uh, each individual transaction and the creation of money um so basically every single transaction you know the structure of that transaction you know where the money came from you know where it's going to um but what regulation do we need between the state and ourselves to control that problem and i think it's just not been addressed um we need a privacy relationship we simply haven't got one and one of the things i would suggest is it, oh, it's back working thanks okay smash. um uh, so one of the things i would suggest is that this is where the a lot of work needs to be done we need to understand just what that relationship is and how it's going to be um that's going to be regulated um and it's interesting because central banks think of regulation they put on other people they don't think of regulation that's put on them and uh one of the things i would say is that uh having looked at the government's proposals on nhs data national health service data um it wouldn't give you a great feeling that this whole idea about the relationship between the individual and the state has been looked into as thoroughly as it ought to be the last question i want to ask is about the international payment system what will the creation of a cbdc or cbdc's in general do to the international payment system um well i um Anybody who's listened to my lectures on this, I'm not a I'm not a great um, believer. There ever well, there was a gold standard, but I'm not a great believer that it ever really existed in the way in which it's often talked about. Um, what we really had in the 19th century was a sterling system. Uh, basically, commer commerce was conducted through um, a regulated banking system. The central bank, the Bank of England, was highly trusted. Uh, the banking system it regulated was seen as as about as good as it could get in that date and uh international commerce was dominated by a bill drawn on london uh after Bretton woods and the second world war sterling clearly um could not continue in the role it had had previously and sterling was replaced with the us dollar um and that ended the gold standard version of it the convertibility of of um uh, of the uh, us dollar into gold uh, ended in 1972 but the global trade economy didn't really change that much um so i what i would suggest is that the global trading system is actually remarkably resilient we often think of it as uh, in the economics as i think too much the other way around we look at um the central banks rather than looking at commerce and industry and saying how does it affect that it practiced the convertibility of sterling or dollars into gold that never really existed for for the vast well for the, for the overwhelming majority of the people and um and uh and companies uh, so the lack of it didn't really make any difference or much um there have been intellectually coherent alternatives to uh a dollar standard um and uh the first one in fact is actually going to be well the first one i think was best one was put forward by john maynard keynes uh at bretton woods and that was the bancor uh, which was a global international reserve currency but also a currency you could trade in um that was kind of vetoed by the us who wanted just simply to replace sterling with the dollar um lately um of course libra came up with very much the same sort of idea Libra was more or less the same idea as a bank core. Um, and it was retail form as well. Now that got kind of squashed as well. So now what we have uh, is DM, which is just a series of uh, individual digital currencies. Um, so what makes a digital currency, digitization of currency different? Well, I think the answer is that it links the commercial transaction and the international payment system much more closely than they've ever been linked before. Um, what we're used to these days is uh, virtually everything is made in China. 
virtually having uh, um, in more mainly more ways than one. Um, and yet the renminbi is not a convertible currency and probably won't be, um, or at least not in the anything like the near future. China still has exchange control. Does that matter as much in a digital currency world as it did in a non-digital currency world? And I think the answer is, I think it doesn't. And I think it certainly doesn't matter as much, um, mainly because whatever you want to buy from China, you buy as you have done you know, before, before any digitization, you can just, you can use a digital currency, but you could use any other currency. Um, what people in China buy from you is now very transparent. That comment about what happens when you've got the ultimate surveillance state, uh, once you have a, a digital national currency um, that runs on a, on a blockchain, um, the state knows everything. And it knows exactly what transactions it will allow to be convertible and what ones it won't. So I think that, um, that that's the control mechanism becomes much more powerful than it's ever been before. And I don't believe, I'm sure, that China really fears its trade account. It's not the trade account that's the issue. The issue of convertibility of the RMBI, I believe, is the capital account. Um, what the Chinese state does not want is its citizens having the ability to convert their holdings of renminbi, domestic renminbi, into, into holdings of dollars or euros. And an interesting sort of corollary to this, I think, um, is that you also would not want domestic Chinese companies listing in the US because they, in that way, become subject to US law. And I do think that currency digitization potentially offers China a route to a parallel trade and payment system um, with its trading partners. And in those trading partners, I include you and me, by the way. I think this is uh, digital currency revolutionizes the whole system. Um, so I believe the system will be entirely digital. It will be based on a sort of international version of Alibaba. And Alibaba is already pretty international. So. Uh, but it may well be much more state controlled. Um, and uh, what we will have is no replacement of the US dollar, but a parallel system to the US dollar. That holds out the prospect of massively weakening the US authorities hold on the global political economy through its sanction system. And that's gonna be the target. So that's my four questions. Um, I hope you found them interesting. I kind of hope that many people today or a number of the speakers today won't entirely agree with any of those and, and or expand or will be able to expand on them uh, because I learned from that and I hope you will do the same. So four questions that I think we need to answer uh, and that will be fundamental to money and payments in the 21st century. Thank you. <laughs> I don't mind taking questions if people want to know. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, uh, Brandon. That was a fascinating insight into the link between payments. And that, certainly that last question is, will the creation of CBDCs and what will it do to the international payment system is I think the crux of what we want to talk about today, because I think we do mostly agree and I'll be interested to hear the views of the um, people watching whether this is something which we can agree will change the landscape of, of payments and therefore the monetary system and it'll be interesting to see what that is like. Um, I'm going to hand over to the next speaker now. We'll take questions at the end if we may, um, because uh, Diego um, uh, Zulu Aga is joining us remotely. So I'm going to hand over to Diego now just to um, uh, make his presentation and then after that I will introduce David Birch and then we'll have the questions at the end. So Diego I can see you on the screen now, over to you, thank you. Wonderful, thank you Chris, I really appreciate it and thank you Juan for um, putting together this conference. I'm excited to hear everyone else's contributions, I appreciated what Brandon had to say just now and I think his four questions are very much on point. If that's okay I'm going to share my screen for which I think you need to remove the existing slide deck. Great. And now I can go to mine. 
Just bear with me one second. Here we are. And you should be able to see it now. Sorry. Here we are. So Juan asked me to talk about the regulation of digital currencies. And of course, even the term digital currency is by now so broad as to describe very different things. One thing I would like to say at the outset is that we tend to think of cryptocurrencies, which were the original object of analysis when we talked about digital currencies, as something relatively new. And I suppose it is, but Bitcoin has by now been around for almost 13 years. If Bitcoin were a startup, it would probably no longer merit the name of a startup. It would probably already have IPO'd. And indeed, the market capitalization of Bitcoin is very much significantly higher than it was in 2009 or 2010. What I find most remarkable, though, of the, around the developments over the last couple of years, three years, is how we've moved from focusing on cryptocurrencies as the key development in the digital currency space through stablecoins, uh, and particularly Libra DM, which became the focus of attention uh, for regulators about two years ago, and very quickly into central bank digital currencies, which are now focusing a lot of the attention, not only from policymakers, but I think also from the private sector, in terms of trying to see what kind of product developments could be aligned with a potential CBDC to provide new forms of payment and potentially increase competition in the provision of payments, as well as other services that banks have historically dominated. So my, um, my focus is going to be, first of all, on how policymaker interest in digital currencies has ebbed and flowed over the years. I'm going to briefly go over the types of digital currencies that we can broadly taxonomize. Some of the purposes of regulation in looking at digital currencies, what is regulated, and some of the consequences. Finally, what countries are doing to regulate and how they're competing with each other. And I will conclude with two sketches of the future, one of which I think is more likely, but which would lead to quite significantly different uh, developments as far as the balance between public digital currencies and private ones is concerned. This is a chart of the Bitcoin price, as I'm sure many of you will have guessed over the last three years. I don't think in itself it tells us very much about regulatory developments. However, it is the case that policymakers have tended to be more interested in cryptocurrencies, in digital currencies more generally, uh, when the price of Bitcoin went up, because that indicated a lot of consumer interest in cryptocurrency, uh, potentially also interest from custodians and financial intermediaries and in getting involved in this sector. And so inevitably that led to increased discussions of the topic of regulation. So let me point to two particular developments. In 2018, we had something called the ICO boom. ICO stands for Initial Coin Offering. This was an industry acronym that was developed clearly to uh, make a parallel with initial public offerings. But the idea was that cryptocurrency projects which by definition have no intermediary, they're decentralized projects, they're not like a business. It was a way for them to raise funds for developers to build the requisite infrastructure. That created a lot of um, tension with regulators because there was a sense that this type of offering was very prone to scams and abuses and consumers had no recourse to recover their funds if they had been scammed out of them by a dodgy so-called cryptocurrency project. And then about a year and a half later, in June of 2019, Facebook, together with a consortium of other tech, mostly tech businesses, announced that they would come up with a hybrid digital currency, a hybrid meaning bringing together a basket of different relatively stable central bank currencies, fiat currencies, called Libra. And that, again, prompted a tremendous amount of policymaker interest, not least because of the size of Facebook and some of the other companies concerned. Uh, and the particular worry that a lot of economic activity could begin happening in Libra, that this could have not only cross-border implications, but in not only in, in the weaker monetary systems, but also in more developed countries, that this could have an impact on financial stability, because this would be a type of financial institution that didn't fit the mold of existing ones, but also that it might challenge the dominance of central banks and their control over monetary policy. I will talk a little bit later about the merits of that particular concern. Now, 
I think it's helpful to have a quick taxonomy of the three types, three broad types of digital currency as currently exist. The first and oldest are cryptocurrencies, which are a digital representation of value that chiefly can be transferred between peers without using an intermediary. And Bitcoin was the first of these. The title of the Bitcoin paper that defined what Bitcoin would be was a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. This is actually something that Milton Friedman had talked about in the late 90s as the next development of the internet, whereby you would build a software protocol that allowed the transfer of value from A to B without A knowing B and B knowing A, and without an intermediary being involved in verifying the transaction. Well, the Bitcoin white paper and Bitcoin infrastructure itself has made this possible. And while we may have doubts as to the merits of Bitcoin as a medium of exchange and even perhaps a store of value and its ability to ever become money, there is no question that the protocol has withstood the test of time. It hasn't been hacked and it's led to transfers of value that may be more or less legitimate, but it's still active 13 years later. The second type of stable coins. This is again an industry term, slightly misleading because stable coins are not always fully stable. But stablecoin stands for a digital representation of value, which is usually issued by a private intermediary or a consortium of companies. And it purports to maintain a stable value by referring to a fiat currency or several fiat currencies. Libra initially was intended to be a hybrid. Now that it's become DM, uh, it will probably be a US dollar only stablecoin. And the idea is that by trust, by declaration, maybe by prudential regulation, the issuers of stable coins hold enough in reserve to guarantee the redeemability of a stable coin one for one for the fiat currency that they're supposed to represent. One thing I would like to clarify is that while stable coins often evoke the thought of Libra because it's in the press and as far as policymakers are concerned, the most significant stable coin that there has been discussion about, Libra DM hasn't yet launched. What we have instead are smaller stable coins, one known as USD coin issued by Circle in the United States, another one called Tether. And these tend to be used in, on cryptocurrency exchanges as a way to make it easier to move from dollars to cryptocurrency. Say someone wants to invest across cryptocurrencies. Well, one way to retain the equivalent, say, of a money market fund that you would have in a stock investment account is to have a store of stable coins because they're more easily transferred into cryptocurrencies. It, and given the quick price movements and the pension that there is for speculation on cryptocurrency markets, that timing advantage can make a difference to traders. The third type are central bank digital currencies, probably the most prominent now, and these are a representation of value issued by a central bank and importantly to non-financial businesses and households. The idea is that the central bank's balance sheet opens up not only to commercial banks and other regulated entities. In the case of the Bank of England, there are a few, as Brandon was saying, a few non-banks that are able to keep a settlement account with the Bank of England. Uh, but even that is quite limited right now. Various other central banks, the ECB, the Fed, are talking about expanding access to, the, to, to central bank accounts. But in this case, this would allow anyone to keep their funds with the central bank, either directly or more likely in an intermediated fashion. And to give a sense of how fast the progression of discussion of CBDCs has been, the first white paper that was published on this issue by a major central bank was by the Bank of England in March of 2020, right before the outbreak of the COVID pandemic in earnest. And since then, the ECB has issued a discussion paper, the Fed is about to release one, but the ECB has also announced, as has the Bank of England, that they're going to pursue additional research to explore launching a, a central bank digital currency in the medium term. By the medium term, we mean sort of 2025, 2026. I regard it as likely that both central banks will progress with some form of a CBDC, probably an intermediated one. So that's as far as the background is concerned. Now, in terms of what objectives policymakers pursue when discussing regulation of digital currencies, typically they fall into four categories. Consumer investor protection, the idea that there should be adequate disclosures, that there should be a regulatory regime for issuing digital currencies of different kinds, that these should be uh, truthful in the um, statements that they make to potential investors, that they should handle funds with due care and treat customers fairly. That is one bucket. The second one is anti-money laundering and know your customer or anti-terrorist financing regulations. This is of great concern in the area of cryptocurrencies because there is no intermediary. The absence of an intermediary means that you cannot in principle hold anyone 
add Bitcoin liable for uh, circulating uh, or allowing transactions by dodgy players, people engaging in not only illegitimate, but potentially illegal transactions, drug trade, financing of terrorism, those sorts of things. And so that's been a major concern with regard to cryptocurrencies. Also with some stable coins, to the extent that the issuers are not regulated in the same way as other financial intermediaries, and might therefore not be subject to the same information collection requirements as other bodies. The third bucket, which is becoming more and more important, it rose to the forefront with the Libra announcement, is prudential risk management. The idea that some players, Brandon called them tech fins, uh, some of the larger uh, tech companies perhaps, who are wanting to become involved in the digital currency space, are not subject to prudential regulation because they're not licensed as commercial banks. Um, in the UK and to a lesser extent in the Eurozone, the definition of a bank is relatively flexible and it is up to the regulator to adapt it over time and to grant licenses and authorizations and access to central bank accounts as they deem fit, although there are restrictions. In the United States, by contrast, the definition is much more rigid. It's based on 1950s legislation and also the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, and therefore it's less straightforward to try and incorporate new types of issuers into the banking regulatory framework. And that poses some concerns among policymakers. And then finally, there's the impact on monetary and financial stability, perhaps of greatest interest to an IIMR audience. And I think that the consequences are much less clear. To begin with, cryptocurrencies are very small in overall um, market capitalization and transaction volume. They're not money. They're not substituting for a generally accepted medium of exchange in any major country. There are a few instances, latterly we've heard of El Salvador, um, before we used to talk about Venezuela. There are instances of countries with, say, capital controls, incredibly unstable central bank and monetary policy, rapidly depreciating currencies where cryptocurrencies may have substituted for a while because they're comparably stable and they are accepted by traders in exchange. But that is the exception rather than the rule. The impact therefore on monetary policy of cryptocurrencies is very minimal. When it comes to stable coins, the same thing applies. There are lots of concerns about a potentially big player issuing a, um, a redeemable um, dollar equivalent say. And as a result of that, in being outside of the, um, monet the traditional monetary channels, having an impact on monetary policy. But I think there, the full backing of every stablecoin issued in the first place. And then in the second place, the fact that stablecoins are used for very specific purposes and are unlikely to substitute for money as it exists today. Um, mitigates some of that concern. And then with CBDCs, it's issued by the central bank. It's part of its, not only its management of the payment system and its management of prudential requirements on banks to the extent that banks would be issuing um, CBDCs to the public uh, or, or intermediating them to the public. Um, it's the, the, the concerns there are much less because the central bank has a remit to decide what happens and what, how much is issued and what the requirements are in intermediaries in, in these units. So when we talk about regulation, typically we're talking about regulating intermediaries. For cryptocurrencies, it's about issuers and exchanges where individuals and businesses can access digital currencies, regulating custodians and the people who provide digital wallets where consumers store their cryptocurrencies and stable coins. Sometimes there is regulation of instruments themselves. There will be features perhaps of cryptocurrencies that are deemed unlawful, like full privacy of the transaction record, where it's not even visible on the ledger on a pseudonymous basis, who has received and who has sent uh, currencies. And because of AML concerns, that might be something prevented by regulation. And then finally, there may be restrictions or regulations on the holders of digital currencies. For example, to what purposes they can use them. Uh, also monitoring of tax compliance. This is a big issue in the case of crypto because of the very significant changes in, in or rather the appreciation in the price of a lot of these uh, cryptocurrencies over time and the tax implications of that because they're subject to capital gains tax. And then in the case of CBDC specifically, quantity limits on holdings. This is something the ECB is particularly keen on. And the goal there is to give some amount of transaction account on CBDCs to consumers and businesses without disrupting commercial banks tremendously or giving an outlet where, for example, you might have a massive flight, a sort of digital bank run from commercial bank money 
to CBDCs when there is a loss of confidence. The friction in a traditional bank run of going to the bank, waiting in a queue, getting your cash out and then stuffing it under the mattress is greater than if you can at the press of a button transfer funds from commercial banks into CBDCs. And there's therefore a concern among policymakers that this could have financial stability implications. And a way to deal with them is to have quantity limits on CBDC holdings. Now, some a sketch of uh, some consequences of regulation that I think are interesting to note. In the area of crypto, what's most remarkable is that regulatory announcements have a strong impact on cryptocurrency prices. Crypto is a very immature market. It's illiquid. A lot of people are holding tokens. What's traded as a proportion of what's available is relatively small, and therefore the impact on price is very strong. But also because there's a tremendous regulatory uncertainty around cryptocurrencies, regulatory announcements have a strong impact on the prospects for use and applications and even adoption by financial intermediaries of cryptocurrency. So we see both positive and negative impacts from regulatory announcements on crypto prices. This is something that the Bank for International Settlements has studied in some detail and, uh, and they have some compelling evidence for this. Now, a challenge that all regulation faces with crypto is the absence of an intermediary, as I mentioned earlier. The attempt is to try and fit cryptocurrencies and other digital currencies into existing rule books. This is not always easy because not only is there an intermediary absent, but some of the entities that are interested in issuing digital currencies are not even financial institutions in the first place, or they may not have started out as financial institutions. In the case of the United States, they might not even be entitled to become financial institutions because in America, there's a ban on commercial companies, that is any non-financial business, owning a bank other than very uh, strict, very, very limited restrictions or very limited uh, exemptions rather from that ban. So it would be very difficult in, in the US context for some firms to undertake this activity under the regulatory framework that exists currently. And then perhaps most importantly, I think for, for our purposes, regulation can change the attractiveness of different types of digital currency, particularly between stable coins and CBDCs because to an extent they could be substitutes. And what I see there is as the interest grows by central banks to consider and launch CBDCs, policymakers have become less keen to create a friendly regulatory environment for stable coins. And rather, they seem to be more focused on applying existing regulations to stable coins and favoring the growth of CBDCs. I'm making a bit of a, this is a bit of a subjective judgment and, and also I'm, I'm reading into the future, but I certainly see a change of narrative latterly in favoring CBDCs over stable coins. And whether we think CBDCs are better than stable coins or not, clearly this has an impact on consumer adoption of one or the other. Now, one law in quotes, which I have found applies consistently in digital currencies around the world, and this I cannot fully claim credit for because well, I'm sure other people have um, identified it as well, but I think it applies broadly, is that the more financial services focused the jurisdiction is, the more likely it is to want to create a friendly environment for digital currencies. Some examples for this are Gibraltar, Singapore, financial services centers, uh, as well as Switzerland, which has a huge financial services sector compared to its GDP. By contrast, the jurisdictions that have consumer financial markets that are very large tend to create hostile environments for digital currency. And this is the, you know, we have examples here from China, which has banned many forms of cryptocurrency mining, the EU that has recently introduced a proposed regulation for stable coins that would be quite onerous, and then India, which has had a series of quite haphazard interventions into digital currency, but as a rule, they've been negative for the development of that sector. And so that leaves jurisdictions that have both a highly developed financial sector and a large consumer market, jurisdictions like the UK and the US in an awkward position because they must navigate that kind of trade-off. And it is not clear that they've settled on exactly what it is they want to do. There's been a carrot and stick approach in a lot of these jurisdictions. There were early efforts to attract cryptocurrency activity by giving a relatively straightforward uh, regulatory classification, um, particularly differentiating between utility tokens, security tokens, and payment tokens, depending on the use of cryptocurrencies. We can get into the detail of this later. I don't think we need to explore it uh, uh, right now. But it's important to note that this was very much 
thinking in competition with the US, where defining a security is something that's subject to the courts and up to the courts and up to the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's not something that the SEC could itself change. And so if you're a regulator with greater flexibility abroad, that was an opportunity to attract activity. There are also more consumer focused uh, regulatory interventions like warnings against investment in volatile assets and restrictions, clamping down on crypto mining in some jurisdictions. And then finally, there's been a strong backlash against private stable coins as a result of the Libra announcement and an attempt to create new regulatory frameworks to accommodate stable coins. This in the EU is known as MICA, the Markets in Crypto Assets Regulation, and it's still under discussion, but it is a very, as, as is usual with the EU, a very comprehensive piece of legislation with um, very prescriptive requirements from stablecoin issuers and, and other crypto issuers, as it happens, but um, but quite top down and uh, and would significantly raise costs for issuers of of these digital currencies to compete. So to conclude, given the remarks I've just given, I see two scenarios: one more likely, one less so, for the future. The likely one, which I call scenario one, is that CBDCs dominate. We expect all major central banks to publish detailed discussion papers um, you know, about the launch of a potential CBDC by 2030. I think it could be even earlier, particularly in the UK and in the Euro area. We also are starting to see regulation that would make stablecoins relatively uncompetitive with CBDCs, potentially complementary to CBDCs. What I mean by that is that something like Libra DM could become an onboarding system, a customer facing set of applications for CBDCs to be used by the public. Because one thing central banks don't really do is interact with the public. And so a lot of the user facing activity is expected to be carried out by private intermediaries. And perhaps Libra Diem could be repurposed for that. So stable coins could become complementary to CBDCs, but subsidiary to them. And then cryptocurrency might remain mainly speculative in advanced economies, maybe adopted in, in unstable jurisdictions for other purposes. And the same thing could be said of foreign CBDCs where the dollar, just like countries have dollarized in the past, uh, particularly by having circulating US cash in, in a lot of their economic activity. Um, something similar could happen with digital currencies or digital CBDCs, depending on the design and how easily available it is for foreign um, individuals and businesses to use it. That's a more likely scenario. One that I think is plausible but less likely is that private digital currencies actually do flourish, that CBDCs are later to develop or perhaps do not develop at all because there are legal restrictions, there is opposition. This I think most likely in the US uh, to, to the development of CBDCs and therefore stable coins grow because they're an attractive substitute for e-money and for bank accounts. Um, in addition, CBDCs might only develop in certain niche jurisdictions and cryptocurrency use cases might develop for more things than speculative investment. They could be more widely used for payments, potentially for equity raising, a cheaper way to raise funds with transparency and adequate disclosures. And then finally, private intermediaries, by which I mean fund managers and banks, might want to become more involved in crypto markets. This has already happened. I think this is actually more likely than the rest of the developments, but it really hinges on what the regulatory developments are in the future and to what extent CBDCs become the sole focus of policymakers to the detriment of other forms of digital currency. So with that, I'll stop. And uh, I'm very happy to take questions during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diego. Um, that was a uh, well thought through presentation on the current state of play and some interesting predictions that I'm going to quiz you on 
later, particularly around stable coins and CBDCs, which we speak a lot um, uh, with, at the cent- uh, in, with many of the central banks in, on Fifth every week about this um, sort of battle of tension between CBDCs and stable coins and which one of these will, um, I suppose, be the tool for monetary policy making or I suppose represents the future. And I wouldn't say it's quite as, as clear cut as you were saying there. And I've got a couple of examples that I will share with you in the Q&A. But before we do that, if it's OK, Diego, I'd like to ask David Birch to come up and give his presentation. And um, please do keep putting questions in the chat box. I will absorb them and we'll have a discussion as well here in the uh, in the lecture theater but right now david welcome thanks very much chris mm-hmm. uh, and thanks very much for inviting me along i really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and talk to you today because it's it's such an interesting topic and there's so much going on so i'm i'm going to talk from a slightly different direction from the other speakers because i'm going to talk a little more technologically so what i'm going to do is um Uh, explore a little bit about how we might actually implement uh, central bank digital currencies in different cases. Uh, And in order to do that, um, I want to show you my reasoning a bit. So so what I'm going to do first is talk about what the drivers for central bank digital currencies are. And I've organized those in in a hopefully useful way. And then I'll talk about what the implications of those drivers are on the potential technological implementations and, and suggest a straw man. Uh, to go forward. And then we'll have a a super quick look at a couple of examples. So so let's start by, uh, this is me, you don't need to know about me for that. Oh, I wrote some books, but that's that's a very important point. You must keep that in at all costs. Um, And uh, I've been I've been boring people at length about this about this topic for a while. Because I think that the implications of central bank digital currencies are, are quite extensive. And, and there are some obvious ones. I mean, we, you see people talking about you know, the impact on retail banks and, and all this sort of thing. But actually, as you'll see when I talk about the drivers, I think the implications are much greater than that. And I, I sort of side with Brandon on this. And I think we're, we're about to see a, a sort of fundamental shift in money, um, much like we saw a few hundred years ago. Um, and this kind of echoes, uh, I mean, and, and you know, more than one person has made this point, which is that the way that money works, I mean, what we think of the Bretton Woods II kind of structure is, um, is a set of temporary institutional arrangements. It's not a law of physics that's inviolable. You know, it, it changes under different pressures and it's about to change again. So um, what do I think the drivers are? I've organized them into six key drivers to make them easy to to think through. So, um, uh, and I've I've organized these in sort of, in in some groups. But anyway, so I'm I'm just gonna take you through my sort of six key drivers so you can see why I think the way I'd, by the way, this isn't stuff that I just made up. I got this from, you know, the Bank of England and the ECB and various other places. So, uh, I mean, what I did was sort of organize it slightly. and, and, and the six key drivers are, are broadly monetary. So you have the issue of sovereignty, domestic policy, and the issue of influence, the extent to which, and I, I just finished reviewing a, a UN paper about this, by the way, because obviously we tend to think about the impact of digital currencies on our economy, but um, as was just hinted at by Diego, um, there might be pretty substantial implications for other economies, and, and in particular um, in developing markets. Uh, there's the issue of cashlessness and linking the um, development of central bank digital currency into a wider cashlessness strategy, which we don't actually have at the moment, but, but that's not the point. Um, and then there's the point about resilience and critical national infrastructure. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about sustainability, which has now entered this debate. Um, it hadn't when I wrote my book about it originally, but it's, it's a new topic. And then I'm going to finish talking about innovation because I think this is the most important part of the discussions that we should be having now about how CBDCs are going to work. So let's talk first of all about um, sovereignty. Um, there are a number of different possibilities. Here's some information. Whoops. Hey, some information about sovereignty. That's handy. Just, just at the very, how timely, just when I needed it. Useless piece of junk. Um, right, so uh, I forgot what I was gonna talk about now. Oh yeah, sovereignty. 
uh, just before we came down here, we were we were talking a little bit about optimal currency areas. And it's certainly true that the theory of optimal currency areas will have to be revised because it has to take into account the fact that these optimal areas are now virtual as well as as well as physical. And what might constitute an optimal currency area in a mixed physical and virtual environment is a very, very interesting topic. It's one of the reasons why I think that actually, despite the sort of dreams of the Bitcoin maximalists and the Star Trek fans, we're not going to end up with some global um, some global, that's just not going to happen. I mean, it's hard enough to get a euro to work for Germany and Greece. So quite how you would get a single currency to work for Earth and Alpha Centauri is not at all clear to me. And in fact, I think the technology will take us in the opposite direction. The decentralizing nature of the technology means that not only will we have more currencies, we'll have different kinds of currencies. And it may well be that all of these kinds of currencies can actually coexist because they have different purposes and different uses and they're optimal in different ways. So I just to stimulate debate, I put up a few examples. I thought, for example, um, you know, uh, we might see a Chinese digital currency, which becomes a sort of single market currency along the Belt and Road. Uh, who knows, in Eastern Europe, for example, you know, Bitcoin might, might go into common use. Nobody uses Bitcoin, but I mean, in the future, who knows? Um, in uh, perhaps in Africa, Latin America, you might see DM and, and different DM. That's because in those countries, the internet is to a large extent Facebook. And so, so it has a, a, an obvious effect there. We might see the, the US dollar as the global reserve still, and so on. And we might get, for example, a Canadian dollar, which um, plays on privacy. Uh, we might see you know, an Australian dollar that becomes a regional currency and so on. But my point is um, the issues of sovereignty and control over monetary policy are real and have to be taken into account. But so, and, and, and obviously, I mean, I don't want to cover the things that other people have talked about. So, I mean, obviously, in the design of that central bank digital currency, we don't want to design something that's going to, to, to cause. But I mean, no, no central bank is suggesting doing this anyway. So there's, there's no point talking about it. Um, <clears throat> but the other point, the other side of it, the, the impact of digital currency choices we make on other countries are in many ways... Um, more important. So uh, Niall Ferguson phrased this rather well. So he said, he was talking about America here. He said, if America is smart, it'll wake up and start competing for dominance in digital payments. Um, the extent to which currencies are an instrument of soft power uh, has to be taken into account in these discussions. We can't pretend that doesn't exist. If it turns out, for example, that um, some, for, so some particular central bank digital currency becomes a global central bank digital currency, which is, which is quite, quite likely. There are, there are lots of reasons why you would do this. I mean, if you're a farmer somewhere in Africa and you buy your tractors from China and you buy your, your fertilizer from China and you sell your, um, I don't know, soya beans or whatever it is that farmers do, uh, to, to China, then why would why would you go through the costs and complexities of local currencies and dollars and conversions and SWIFT? Why wouldn't you just use Chinese digital currency? You know, now if um, and it, and actually just to just to force you to think about that point a little bit more, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to be challenged about this later on in the debate. But I could say, at least as a as a valid debating point, if there was a viable. US digital dollar, I mean, whether it was a sort of DM private sector dollar or a USDC private sector dollar or a Fed, uh, you know, central bank digital dollar. But if there was a central bank digital currency version of the dollar, which anybody in the world could store on any old mobile phone, something like 150 out of the 170 odd uh, currencies in the world would vanish overnight. No sane person would hold any of these currencies when they have the option of holding dollars instead. So the implications are quite severe. And if your currency disappears, uh, your ability to control monetary policy disappears and you essentially become subject to the whims of, of the Fed or, or somebody else. So there are good reasons why people would want to do this because if we can increase trade, we can increase prosperity and that's good for everybody. Um, but uh, we can't pretend it doesn't have implications. Uh, the third point is cashlessness. Um, there's um, what I, what I, I, I mean, I, I call some is the Swedish problem, which is if you just allow cashlessness to happen, 
um, people get marginalized and excluded. So cashlessness is happening. You, you look around everywhere. Um, I was at uh, Silverstone on um, Sunday uh, for the British Grand Prix. Doesn't really have anything to do with this presentation. I was just making Brandon jealous with the, the, the yeah. So, um, uh, and I happen to know, because I'm very boring and get involved in these things, only 8% of the transactions on site were done using cash. Um, you know, you could quite imagine in a year or two's time, there'll be no cash at all in places like that. Cash will vanish from, from polite society. Um, it will become, I don't know, a bit like drunk driving or something, I suppose. You just won't do it anymore. I mean, if you, if you try to pay with, in Waitrose with cash, people will assume you're a drug dealer or something. Or So, um, so we're going cashless, but we don't actually have a strategy for cashlessness. And so we'll end up with problems. So what we need to do is to have an actual national strategy for cashlessness. This is this is the bones of one up here, just to make things easy for any government ministers that happen to be tuning in. So we need a we need a national strategy for cashlessness, and digital currency needs to be part of that strategy. So it it's it doesn't it's something just in isolation that just happens is my point there. So uh, and there are different aspects to that strategy, and I don't want to get sidetracked into all of them here, taxation and money laundering and all this sort of thing, but uh, we're going cashless. So digital currency should be part of a recognition of that kind of thing. And actually I'm rather interested in that because I think it may give us the opportunity to restructure some elements of financial markets and financial instruments to sort of recalibrate them for the, for the new economy. We have, a, we have a sort of banking and financial services environment which is rooted in a sort of rather nostalgic sort of 1950s version of, of the world where you know there's full employment and people have one job for life and and so on and, and clearly that we we need to rebuild you know products that are built on the new demographics and this might be a way of, of doing part of that oh sorry wrong, wrong button again um uh resilience um uh, and I'll come back to this when I talk a little bit more about the technology. The idea that we would build, um, I mean, I was trying to explain, this is a, a version of this diagram that I did for the Reserve Bank, to go to the Reserve Bank of Australia. Um, the idea that we would build, and it's a good example here because they have a faster payments infrastructure the same as we do. So the idea that we would build the digital currency infrastructure on top of the existing electronic money infrastructure is is stupid that that would that that would reduce resilience that wouldn't increase it what we need to do is build the digital currency infrastructure in parallel with the electronic money infrastructure so in other words we keep what we have now the the faster payments and rtgs and next generation payments all this sort of thing um, and that's great and we carry on dealing with those and the world of bank accounts carries on as normal but just as cash doesn't live in a bank account, nor does electronic cash. So digital currency is going to be something that lives in my pocket, in my phone, in my car, in my house, in my hat, badge, what, who knows where. But the point is it doesn't live in bank accounts. We want to keep those things separate. And we're, we've all seen, I mean, in the UK, we have a particularly tottering infrastructure. So not a week goes by without that. You don't see something in the paper about somebody's gateway fell over and nobody could use their debit cards and the ATM stopped working and no one could buy anything at McDonald's or whatever. Um, and there's an awful lot of money goes on that infrastructure. You still have days when, you know, Visa Europe was down for the afternoon. I mean, RTGS has been down a couple of times in the last few years. And that's the most systemically important payment system that we have. Target 2 went down in October, didn't it, for the afternoon and nobody could clear. So, so the point is, we want to increase the resilience of the financial system uh, to make it um, much more much more resistant to the next wave of cyber attacks. I mean, it's a bit of a digression, but I just show you, for the students watching, the movies about World War Three are going to be a lot more boring than the movies about World War Two because there's going to be no saving Private Ryan and storming beaches and all this sort of thing. It's going to be people in their underpants eating tuna out of a can, uh, staring at a screen. And, and uh, you know, there's not there's not going to be paratroopers landing on the campus of the University of Buckingham. You'll wake up in the morning and turn on your car, and nothing will happen. That's World War Three. 
So um, in order to make the infrastructure more resilient, we need digital currency to be built in parallel with the electronic money system and not on top of it. Uh, so that, you know, next time RTGS or Target 2 falls over, you can still go and buy some beans over at Waitrose using your electronic money, uh, using your electronic cash. Uh, so, um, and again, I, I don't want to kind of completely go over everything Brandon was saying, but, but the point is this does have implications for a lot of the existing infrastructure. If you can transfer some form of central bank digital currency, instantly and for free between electronic wallets, you, you do have to wonder what, you know, acquirers, issuers, switches, networks, schemes, whatever we're going to do all day long, because they become a little bit redundant then. So anyway, don't, we'll talk about that a bit more later on. Okay, so uh, sustainability, this is, this is coming to, this, uh, this is, this is something which I, I, I personally didn't take into account when I was originally writing my book about this. It just wasn't really in my head. But over the last year, it's really, it's really accelerated. And I've noticed that the, the you know, particularly the ECB and, and so on, the issues about sustainability around digital currency have now become part of the package. We have, and, and I do, you know, so for example, in the UK, we, we have now the UK cash industry environment charter. Cash is, uh, uses a lot of single use plastics and, obviously driving vans around full of cash all over the place isn't particularly sustainable and all the ATMs keep getting ram raided and blown up anyway and so basically cash isn't terribly sustainable um, but obviously we don't want an alternative this is a bitcoin mining farm we don't want an alternative that is economically uh, environmentally even less sustainable um, that wouldn't be a very good idea at all so we do have to take into account the environmental costs of our central bank digital currency when we make architectural choices about the technology and um, this th that will reflect on my comments about technology in a moment <clears throat> so um, if we can uh, if we can do that if we can create that kind of so, so this isn't bitcoin basically bitcoin doesn't do instant and free but if there were central bank digital currencies that were environmentally sustainable and were instant and free we would probably start using them to do things that we can't do with the existing infrastructure. So in other words, we shouldn't really be thinking about central bank digital currency as a way of replacing debit cards uh, down at the shop because debit cards down at the shop work pretty well actually for most people most of the time, not universally, hence my point about cashlessness. But uh, if you're thinking about starting a business in this space, uh, which you should be doing, of course, as enterprising businessmen of tomorrow. Um, you, I, I, you know, you might be tempted to start thinking about central bank digital currency opportunities away from those mainstream examples. And the example I put up here is is micropayments. I mean, there's a huge gap in the market around micropayments, which CBDCs might be able to solve. But the last point, and in my opinion, the most important one is that CBDC would, if it was implemented correctly, um, would be a platform for innovation or, or to, to put it in bumper sticker format, um, 10 pound notes don't have an API. So if we have a digital currency platform, which means that people can transfer money instantly for free securely without having to worry about it, um, provided they have some minimal sort of compliance things, then that will allow us to create new products and services that old people like me can't really imagine. Um, but a young person such as yourself can start working on right now. And, and I suspect there is a crossover here with the world of decentralized finance, which isn't really the subject of today's discussions, but this idea of the sort of money Legos where you, you can build up these more sophisticated products. Obviously I tend to favor to Diego's point, more regulated money Legos, but nonetheless, if you look at the Bank of England paper about the costs and benefits of CBDC, I, I can't remember off the top of my head the exact, but I, I think the thing, you know, if they can replace a third of the cash in circulation or something, that's a permanent GDP boost of like 3% or something. And we need permanent GDP boosts. So that's a good idea. Um, but the benefits are vastly greater, but incalculable because we don't know what any of those new products and services will be. So 
it's worth doing on the cost side alone, but actually in the long run, it's the benefit side that's much more important. So if those are the drivers, how will we implement, um, I don't know when you say this, so if those are the drivers, how are we going to implement central bank digital currency to make it all work properly? Well, here is my handy cutout and keep, oh, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. Uh, here's my handy cutout and keep guide to uh, digital cash. Here's my innovation, my tree uh, to help you think about how to implement central bank digital currency. So I've already, I've already said the division at the top, I already showed you that, my resilience point. So if, you, if the resilience bit is true, uh, we have this distinction between electronic money and electronic cash, and we leave electronic money alone. So forget about that. And we start talking about electronic cash that we're going to store in wallets. How are we going to implement that? We've got two choices. We can do it through a single operator or we can do it through multiple operators. If we have a single operator, it's trivial because you just have a big database and put everybody's money in it. Uh, and that's how, for example, M-Pesa worked down in Kenya, which completely transformed uh, the economy down there. Um, and obviously there's, so slight, there's some disadvantages to that because obviously it's a single point of failure and a single operator and blah, blah, blah. So we probably actually want multiple operators to deliver uh, digital cash into the environment. Um, if there are multiple operators, we immediately have this ancient problem of double spending. In other words, if I send some digital bits to, to, to one and then I send the same digital bits to Brandon, who, how do they know who's got the real money? That's the double spending problem. And there are three ways of solving the double spending problem. We can solve it in hardware with chips. That's how it was done with Mondex. And that's because you can't copy chips, but you can copy software. You can do it in software with some jiggery pokery, which we'll come back to in a minute. Or actually, you can do it in nature using quantum mechanics. And if you're curious about that, I'd refer you to the Swedish Central Bank's December report, on um, which they call quantum technology for economists, which I would have called Schrodinger's cash. But that's because I know more about marketing than the Swedish Central Bank does. Now, if we put the production of commercial quantum computers to one side for a moment, which I'm quite looking forward to, actually, because remember, there's about $20 billion worth of Bitcoin floating around out there that whoever gets the first quantum computer can get out and start looting. And if that isn't incentive to build a quantum computer, I don't know what is. Um, and go back to software for a second. Um, before Mr. Satoshi came along, the only way we knew how to solve this double spending problem was with some form of database. And that was how it was done using sort of digicash and this kind of thing. But after Mr. Satoshi, he came up with a very clever and very interesting way of solving the double spending problem in software without having that centralized database. And that was Bitcoin, of course, and the blockchain and so on. And we can essentially use the blockchain to implement two kinds of uh, digital value that will move around. And as you all know, that's fungible and non-fungible value. So things that are not fungible are things like Bitcoin, which are not money. Uh, we don't want to get it sidetracked into it, but in English law, fund fungibility is a fundamental characteristic of money. In other words, if you steal my car and sell it to Brandon, I can go and get my car back from Brandon. But if you steal my money and give it to Brandon, I can't go and get the money back from Brandon because money is fungible and cars aren't, okay? So one, one, amongst the many reasons why Bitcoin isn't money, one of the reasons is it's not fungible. Uh, but of course, you can construct fungible versions as well. So if you look, so there is my handy cutout and keep guide to the world of electronic cash. And as you can see, uh, due to my clever color coding, um, in red, you can see the three things that I think are realistic options. And those three realistic options are, uh, we can do it using, uh, oops, sorry, we can do it using clouds, we can do it using chips, or we can do it using chains. We know it works in the cloud because we've got M-Pesa. We know it works in chips because we have Mondex. We know it works on the chain, well, sort of. Uh, so um, my biases are very clear. I think by far the most cost-effective way to solve the double spending problem at population scale is through the use of hardware, whether that's the SIMs that are used in M-Pesa or the chips that we use to put into Mondex cards. Now, obviously, if you were doing that now, uh, you might think, and this will be a reasonable question from Brandon. Um, if we were going to do this again now, would we do it using chips on smart? Well, no, of course not. We do it using the chips that are in everybody's mobile phones, right? And that's, in fact, the uh, the visa suggestion as well, uh, what they call the two-tier hierarchical infrastructure. So um, you have, uh, this all works because you can store the keys 
in what they call trusted execution environments, what I would call uh, chips. And, you know, iPhones have got those, Android phones have got them, and so on and so forth. So if we want to do something at population scale in the mass market, and we don't want to burn down the Amazon doing it using Bitcoin or something, by far the best way to do that is using the chips that are already out there that can't be copied in everybody's mobile phones. I think it's quite an obvious solution. But uh, we still might want to look, so I keep pressing this button too hard and it goes down twice, I'm sorry. Um, but we might also want to look at using some form of token infrastructure in the wholesale markets because we want the benefits of what you might call this. I mean, I hate calling this because they're not, but smart contracts in the wholesale market. And this is why I think this two tier solution is most likely. So what you will see, this is the Bank of England's uh, diagram, not mine. So what you will probably see is that at the central bank level, and you, you're beginning to see this, I mean, the Bank of England omnibus accounts, finality and so on. So what you'll see in the wholesale markets is uh, some form of shared ledger solution, which will use some form of smart contracts to create these the ability to move money around in wholesale markets and solve the delivery versus payment problems and all this kind of thing. And, and actually, I wouldn't even call, I, I doubt even most of those will be used for money. Most of those will be other digital assets of some kind that will be moved around. And then you have this interface layer, which the Bank of England calls PIPs, Payment Interface Providers, and they have the interface with the public where you have the retail digital currency. So the wholesale digital currency and the retail digital currency will be implemented using very different technologies. Now, there's one crucial point about that. There's one crucial point I want to make about um, the use of the retail technologies. So if you agree with my crackpot theories about the drivers for digital currencies, including cashlessness, if you're going to create something that is a cash substitute, but is resilient, it must work offline. In other words, it must work. I can pay Brandon with my phone and his phone or with my phone and his smart card or with my watch and his hat or whatever these wallets are in the absence of mobile networks uh, or electrical power. If it's going to be a cash substitute, it has to work person to person offline. And if the retail market is going to work person to person offline, it has to go chip to chip. It's the only way of doing it. You can't do it using Bitcoins or things because Bitcoins don't work offline. If you want an offline solution, you have to move the value from chip to chip. OK, so here's my straw man about how I think it will work in the retail market. I was teasing you with my, is it going to be clouds, chips, or chains? Because the answer, of course, is it's going to be all three because the value will move securely between chips. Some of those chips will be held in your personal devices. Some devices, televisions and computers, and they may not have those secure chips in them. The chips will actually be off in the cloud. They'll be hosted and you'll access them that way. So when I say clouds, chips, and chains, actually, I mean all three of them. So what's my conclusion? Um, my conclusion is, actually, uh, everybody already knows this. There's nothing particularly original or interesting in everything I already said. And how do I know that? Well, because we've already started doing it. So I wrote a book a few years ago about the future of money. And I said I thought um, that I could see sort of three different kinds coming up. This is Diego's point again. I mean, everybody's already said all my interesting points. So it's ruining my whole thing, basically. But um, so he said, well, there might be some form of public money and there might be some sort of private money. I think there's going to be both. So he's right about that. But I also think um, to this point about currency areas, we will see new forms of money uh, which are much more related to the communities that that money serves. And one obvious category of that, I think, I don't want to get into it today, but I think one obvious category of that is actually cities. I sort of agree with the World Economic Forum and various other people who think that the future is very city centric. And I can see every reason why, you know, London money, for example, might be might be quite different from the money that's used in the rest of the country. Um, and that, that sounds a very radical thing to say, but I think if you look at the big picture, I don't think it's actually that radical. 
So, uh, so we have those. So we have those three different possibilities. I'm just going to show you two of them now, just to illustrate that everything I just said up until now, everybody else already knows and has started building things. So, if, if you think I was saying things that sound radical, they're really not. So, I'll choose two examples. So, forget my crazy stuff about London money, which will happen, of course. But let's put that to one side. Uh, that gives us the two possibilities, which are private and public. So, we've got two quick case studies: private money which is Facebooks. I told you I was good at marketing. DM, really? Come on. This Facebooks is the private example. Mark Zuckerberg said that he wanted to make sending money as easy as sending a photo. It isn't, of course, for the obvious reason. That if I send you a photo of my cat, which is what I'm wanting to do, if I send you a photo of my cat, I'm not really sending you a photo of my cat. I'm sending you a copy of a photo of my cat. I've still got the photo of my cat you're getting a copy of it. That works very well for photos of cats. But as I mentioned in the connection with the double spending problem, not so well for money. It's actually quite, it's a lot harder to send money than photos of cats, uh, which is why they still haven't managed to get the whole thing up and running. And I won't go over what people already said, but I will draw your attention to the fact that if you go to the very last page of what was the Libra white paper, now the DM white paper, and you go to the very end of the very last page, you'll see tucked away, uh, the real secret source. It says the, an additional goal is to promote an open identity standard. That's because in that world of global wallets, interoperability, that's going to comply with any of the regulatory stuff that Diego was saying, that's an identity game. It's not a money game. So the control rests with the identity, not with the money, which is why DM is some sort of association of umpteen different people that involves all sorts of interesting organizations. Whereas the wallet, Novi, is a wholly owned Facebook subsidiary. So if you want to, so follow the money, right? So if you're thinking of building a great new product on top of this, I'll tell you right now, you're not gonna make a living out of sending CBDC around, but you might make a living out of making the wallets because the identity that's in the wallets is the key control point and the value added services you'll put around it depend on that identity. So uh, that's where I would do my startup if I was you. And finally, uh, so, and here's my public example, which is the People's Bank of China, the People's Bank of China. And by the way, for the people who say, you know, I should tell you, by the way, this started a long time before Libra and DM and whatever. So if anybody thinks that the People's Bank of China central bank digital currency is some sort of knee jerk reaction to DM, I'll tell you right now, they don't do knee jerk reactions to anything. They, they have a plan. They're, they're not like the banks that you're used to. They have strategies and plans and, and things like this. So they've been working on this for a while. Uh, they launched it last year, which was uh, very handy for me, actually, because I, I went around telling everybody that the I went around telling everybody that the People's Bank of China were launching a marketing campaign for my book because they rather handily uh, went live in four major cities the same month my book came out. So I'm very grateful to them for all of that. Uh, but anyway, the point is it's been going on for a long time. It's live and it's up and running. And here's a crucial statement. The DCEP, digital currency, electronic payment, that's the Chinese digital currency, as the Chinese central banks say, can be used without an internet connection, which is crucial, okay? <clears throat> so this means the system will allow offline transactions and the person in charge of it says there, even Libra can't do this, but actually it's a general point, not just Libra, but any blockchain or ledger-based system can't do this. So here is the live Chinese, oh, sorry. So here's the live Chinese central bank um, digital currency. I think that's the Agricultural Bank of China version of it. Um, and as you can see in the center, it allows that what's, what's translated to touch it in the middle. That's, that's offline to device to device transfers. You can only do device to device transfers between devices that have the secure hardware in them. For the overwhelming majority of the population that have smartphones, that's not a problem. You'll see on the left, for people that don't have smartphones, um, they're what they call the bank wallet, what you and I would call a smart card. Um, but it has an interesting advantage because they're using these liquid paper displays, which I love. So that display only uses power 
when it's changing. Once it's changed, it doesn't use power anymore. So you can imagine, like, if you don't have a phone, you have a card. The card says 20 quid on the front. And you go and buy a cup of coffee, tap, and now the card says 15 quid on the front. You know, so for people that don't have phones, they can have these sort of cards. So I told you about the drivers. I told you about the technology tree. I told you some crazy stuff about how it would have to be implemented using chips and phone to phone and not blockchains. And blow me, haven't the Chinese already gone and done it and rendered my whole presentation completely pointless. But thank you for listening anyway. Cheers. Thank you, David. Yes, we are. I don't know if you both want to come up here and how we can get Diego in, uh, in at the, the right time. We've got a few questions. I mean, a, a quick summary from what I saw from me there. I mean, um, this is the most fascinating uh, uh, landscape at the moment. And certainly at the Digital Monetary Institute, we're very lucky to see many technology companies call us up and say, can you introduce us to the central banks? We have the two-tier solution we have the offline solution we have the privacy solution and many of the um uh, private sector members and um some of the people who are using our, our research at the dmi um are starting this conversation with central banks that are absolutely fascinating because you have conservative slow moving organizations who for a, a, a hearing sometimes from the, the, the sort of crypto jungle about how the solution can get there. And it always comes down to what the central bank's policy outcome uh, that the, the they desire the most. You know, what do they want the most? Is it uh, that, that they can't have privacy compromised? Is it that they want to make sure offline transactions are possible? Is it a cash substitute? And all of these things you, uh, often result in, a, in a sort of long conversations about what it is you're trying to achieve. Very interesting to hear what you said, Brandon, about uh, blockchain, whether blockchain would have any role in this at all. I think when we went, when we saw David's um, uh, 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 presentation, you didn't really talk about decentralized finance or blockchain, really, that wasn't, wasn't the topic of today. But there are some central banks who are more open to that than they were before, and more open to, to sort of seeing how that sort of thing would work than, than, than they were previously. And certainly when it comes to Diego's um, uh, a point that the, the kind of direction of travel right now and the tension between CBDCs and stable coins is always putting in one direction and the other. My personal view is at the moment there's a bit more of an openness towards stable coins than there was six months ago. Um, but CBDCs and wholesale CBDCs are, or, or for the retail and wholesale use, are things that are. Um, still being discussed with ever more seriousness. Um, I'm going to come to some of these questions now. I think um, some of them are directed towards individuals, but I think we should probably take them all while we're, while, while we're here on stage if we can. I'll sure. step to the side and then you two can go in. But Diego, if you can come in first, because you're on the screen. So this first question was for you was from Shaker. Um, do you consider the um, IMF special drawing rights as the first form of CBDCs to come? Um, and... The follow on from this question is by its very nature, digital currency and in particular Bitcoin is anything but anonymous. And would you agree that the purpose of regulation is for states to maintain their monetary policy independence? Um, Diego, do you want to answer that question about the purpose of CBDCs and the role of the IMF special drawing rights? This was in one of the IMF papers in, in 2019, I remember. Um, sure, I wouldn't claim expertise in, in SDRs in the way that some other people attending this uh, event might have them, but I think um, ubiquity and, and availability to individuals and households is a key feature and, and businesses is a key feature of CBDCs. So from that perspective, I think SDRs being quite restricted and a basket, a hybrid, are not quite what we would uh, regard as a CBDC. Maybe it has some features of a stable coin of sorts, but my um, obviously the, the intention I think in designing SDRs was potentially for them to catch on and be used internationally more widely. I don't know to what extent that has happened. Um, someone I speak to a lot who used to work at the IMF has always said that there wasn't enough political endorsement of SDRs as a potential means for international trade and, and settlement between countries and so on. So I don't see the relationship as terribly close is my answer to the first one. On the second question about 
um, Bitcoin transactions not being anonymous. That's right. The transactions are pseudonymous. Bitcoin and the Bitcoin ledger is actually a very bad way to undertake criminal activity because the code on the Bitcoin blockchain can be scraped. And there are lots of expert groups of programmers and other people uh, with big government contracts doing precisely that to track illegal financial activity. So it's certainly not the case that you can have that kind of privacy um, on Bitcoin. On the other hand, it is pseudonymous. So unless you have the expertise to trace that back, it's it's not a particularly exposed uh, means of payment. Chris, what was the last um, comment on monetary independence? Yes, um, the, 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 the main purpose of um, uh, being able to regulate currencies is to have monetary independence. And is this compromise? Well, I suppose if, if you have a very well-regulated central bank that has, a, has a, a monetary policy mandate that is acceptable and you have a relatively open economy, then I think that does apply. However, we encounter instances where the absence of competition for the provision of payments and the provision of even circulating media and, and media of exchange leads to bad outcomes for consumers. And sometimes that is caused by central banks, which are poorly governed. I think those are a minority. They're not the ones we focus on in this discussion. So it is monetary independence is a consideration to the extent that it has beneficial macroeconomic impacts and, and it improves the well-being in that way. But I wouldn't say it's the only criterion. Thank you. I'll ask both of you gentlemen to comment on that. There are really three parts of this here. There's any role for the um, International Monetary Fund's special drawing rights, the um, anonymity around Bitcoin and digital currencies, and the way in which you can have independent um, uh, monetary policy um, with digital currency. So, David, do you just want to come and stand in front of the camera and answer that first? So you need to stand between sure, these two. Yeah, I won't, I won't talk to special yeah. drawing rights, although, although you know, there, there was a proposal to make an electronic special drawing right. Um, but to the point about anonymity, I, I think this is a particularly complex issue because I think um, I, I, I can see lots of reasons why people think that the anonymity of cash should be projected into the digital environment. I mean, they're wrong, but I can see why they I can see why they think that um, I would say that anonymity in um, population scale digital cash. Uh, will be a catastrophe. It, it, it means that the, you know, the rich and the powerful will be, you know, cut free of any last remaining um, potential controls or, or constraints. Uh, it would be an environment of warlords, essentially. I don't think any of us would really want. So the anonymity is a disaster uh, at large scale. But the opposite of that isn't or shouldn't be um, total surveillance. So we must be able to find some way to use the technologies available to us, what I call the counterintuitive cryptography technologies. Mm -hmm. You know, we have technologies of cryptographic blinding and zero knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption. When we have ways of, of keeping private data private while transacting using mm -hmm. proofs about mm -hmm. it and so on. So I think sort of technologically, I think I can see how that would come about. What we probably don't have at the moment is the kind of regulatory structures that need to make that work because their regulatory structures are based on a kind of like disclosure or non-disclosure not clever partial disclosure yeah. using cryptography so so i can see we need progress in things like data trusts and data stewardship and stuff like that so anonymity is would be a catastrophe but the alternative shouldn't be big brother mm -hmm. thank you brandon do you want to um uh, stand in between these two yeah. banners so that <laughs> okay. the viewers i think okay. can see you and just uh Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, mm -hmm. I think briefly, I, I would start out on the SDR question. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that really it's that the SDR derives, I believe, quite directly from mm -hmm. Keynes' view about the bank or mm -hmm. um, Bretton Woods. There was one set of really original thought in there, mm -hmm. and that actually did come from Keynes and the idea of a wholly um, uh, global currency. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem that he was trying to address was that. The sterling system only really worked all the while the dominant trade, country in trade, was the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and the UK needed to keep its currency quite expensive, in other terms, um, for, for it to play that international role. 
as soon as it needed to devalue its its currency in order to make it competitive in the 1930s, mm -hmm. the whole system started to collapse because it needed two monetary policies for the same currency. Mm -hmm. And it couldn't have two monetary <laughs> policies. So Keynes' view was, well, there will be a world where the dollar isn't dominant. 1947, mm -hmm. the dollar was dominant. 90% or something of gold reserves were in the US. It, it, you know, it dominated because everybody else's uh, um, economy was shot to pieces by the war. Mm -hmm. Um, so the US was totally dominant, but he foresaw a day when that wouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. and, and hey, we're here, <laughs> you know. Um, and in that, you are going to get this tension again between monetary policies needed and potentially two monetary policies for the same currency. It doesn't work. Now, Libra was the same thinking. Mm -hmm. SDR came from the same thought. And the SDR was a sort of SOP to that view, um, why don't we make the highest level, the, uh, the international reserves that we can create globally, this, this basket currency. Mm -hmm. And that work, that has worked, it has worked, but it's only ever kept at that level because mm -hmm. politically, what the US saw was it was dynamite <laughs> because once you are, it's not your currency that's dominating the global system, it's this other one. And this other one would be determined by the UN, basically. Um, and that was, Keynes, that was Keynes' view, was that it would be made up or And already by today, interestingly, under his proposals, the renminbi would be the largest part of the basket mm -hmm. because it dominates international trade. Um, so, so that was that line of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for political reasons, it's pretty dead in the sense that I think the US will always try to stop it. I think once China gets a, a, a grip on it, it will try to stop it. So I don't think it has a great future. I think it will, but I think it's an intellectually, it's a coherent idea. Whereas actually the monetary systems we've had are incoherent. Mm -hmm. uh, they always lead to this endless problem mm -hmm. that once you become a dominant international currency, you've got trying, you're trying to pursue two two policies, two monetary policies with the same currency, and it doesn't work. It's quite interesting because you kind of got this opportunity now to actually uh, change some of that and to use that example mm. that was in Bretton Woods now as a digital currency or digital currencies, mm. formal sovereign digital mm. currencies become part of the landscape. Mm. But raw political power isn't going away. No. So the, 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 that's the issue there. Um, a, a comment, please, on the, um, uh, the, 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 the surveillance, anonymity, privacy points because you made you made yeah, quite, that was, that you, was the you, big made, point. you made quite that, a few points about that yeah. and that, not all the speakers were quite in the same position on yeah. that. so, well, so why don't you talk talk a little bit about that my view about mm -hmm. that was once you get to mm -hmm. this state where and, it, and they've made the point i think more mm -hmm. eloquently than i did is that you get this enormous tension uh, between the fact that you can't have a totally anonymous currency mm -hmm. because it's a crooked paradise yes but on the other hand if the state mm -hmm has all of the transactions, mm -hmm. yeah, knows everything. Mm -hmm. It knows everything you do, mm -hmm. knows everything I do. Mm -hmm. And that is a world of abuse. Potentially. Because, uh, potentially. Think, because well, it, well, what's very interesting, the, yeah. yeah. I mean, on, well, when yeah. we did some research on this at OnFIF, it's a massive difference of view in different parts of the world. In Western Europe, in Germany in particular, that is the nightmare. That's mm. the dystopian nightmare mm. they don't want to go. In other parts of the world, totally different view mm. and when we've had some of these sessions with um, some other countries they said well your bank knows all of that already i mean mm. you know uh, brandon your, your your bank knows every transaction they could see everything you want right now every time you spend cash you're even on cctv mm. well, what, what, why do you think this is going to be different and then you do start to see that some people think about this a little bit differently to how you and i might instinctively think about that. well that's that's mm. why digital mm -hmm. cash in, and dig, well, digital mm -hmm. money and digital cash back to, mm -hmm. back to dave mm -hmm. we need to keep separate but that yeah. whole digitization mm -hmm. yeah is not a big issue in mm -hmm. china because privacy is not the same issue yes mm -hmm. and therefore they can progress it much more rapidly than we can mm -hmm. they also have identity mm -hmm. getting back to the point david yeah. they have identity we don't mm -hmm. You know, I have no identity card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. neither, neither do you, I suspect. No, I don't, <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. You know, yeah. so um, so our problem is that we start really from a from a not terribly enviable place here. Mm -hmm. We don't have an identity guard system, so we don't know the identity of it, yeah. and we don't have any um, 
we don't we don't have a means of really making this work easily because we've got a population that is at least suspicious i wouldn't put us quite yes, as suspicious some, as the germans yes, but we're yeah. pretty damn suspicious mm -hmm. and if you as i say if you if you read anything about the nhs app and whatever and where that's going um it'll probably make you a lot more suspicious even paranoid about what they want to do with data mm -hmm. and the state remember the hmr or ce is just as much a part of the state as the bank of england is mm -hmm. um so you know do they share data <laughs> well i mean uh, yes yeah. it, it's uh it's it's this uh, need uh, yeah, that I believe exactly. there is to create some buffer mm -hmm. between a digital currency mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. and it's and the legal claims or the legal yes. mm -hmm. position it has. Mm -hmm. And that involves creating a buffer within the state itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. might be a part of the state and you might be a part of the state, but I can't tell you things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And even if that guy over there who is the prime minister tells me to mm -hmm. i still can't do it mm -hmm. there is a legal uh, buffer between us mm -hmm. and i think that's absolutely necessary to make the system work sure uh, the, the the kind of dream here i mean uh, david do you want to come in so we can yeah. actually all be on the camera it's probably a bit easier <laughs> yeah. there so then yeah. we, we can all be we can all be in at one stage i mean the, sure. the, 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 well, the the kind of uh dream of the, the transferring money offline at any point between one thing and another. And I'm talking about digital cash here, I'm not talking yeah, about yeah, commercial yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the example that I'm off, I often use when um, I'm in, interviewed by the mainstream media is, you know, imagine you're a, um, someone working on a building site in San Francisco, you finish a day's shift, the foreman can pay you on WhatsApp on your phone, $350 for that work, you can send $200 back to Guatemala at that moment, you're to your mum, your mum can then go down to the grocery store at that moment, spend the money. I mean, that, that is certainly a dream because you wouldn't start here. You wouldn't start with paper cash that spreads diseases that's not very helpful to kind of to, to get around. So, so, but that dream has implications. It has monetary policy implications. It has all the other implications that we spoke about. So how do we get from this stage where we can see it to where we need to get to for these things to happen? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to I'll mm -hmm. be very boring to Brandon's mm -hmm. point, but I, mm -hmm. I think if we want to do something mm -hmm. about inclusion, which is where your question is going, mm -hmm. we have to do something about identity. That, mm -hmm. the, 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 the barrier to including mm -hmm. people in the financial system, that what keeps them trapped mm -hmm. in a cash economy, what keeps them, and of course the people that are trapped in the cash economy are the people that pay the highest prices, yeah, for yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah, the people yeah. that are abused, the people yeah. that get shaken down, the people who, if they lose their money, they don't have any insurance mm -hmm. and get stolen hard luck. If we want to protect those people, we have to do it through identity. And I mean, I don't want to be deliberately provocative, but I mean, identity cards might not be the best way of doing that. And it, 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 it's not crazy, in my opinion, to say, well, look, in some countries, actually, what if a Facebook account actually is the, mm -hmm. the, the best form of identity, the most helpful? I mean, it, it sounds odd to us, yeah, but, yeah. But, but the point is, you know, a bank account that was opened with, you know, a forged passport. I mean, is that is that actually better for law enforcement and society mm. than a Facebook account? Mm. I mean, like mm. Facebook, they may not know absolutely I'm Dave Birch, mm. but if I get up to no good, mm. they know who my friends are. They know been, they know where I am. They can mm. see it on the mm. app, you know. So, so the idea that we should rethink that identity mm. side of things a bit and move to these more. Um, modern digital yeah. network based versions yeah. of identity probably holds a lot I, of I, I hate the word, but a sort of more holistic view about what your identity well, is I so take of, it from all sorts of different I kind yeah, of think that's right rather than I've got an identity card with this number on it yeah mm. and, so, and, yeah. and and you know I have personally seen it particularly during um uh, covid-19 th th this changed dramatically you know now if we if we went to a pub here in buckingham the three of us after we would give our phone number we would scan our qr code in i some of this is going to the state some of it's going to the pub but that view of identity and and and, and data i think has changed partly because of the pandemic partly because of how we've used data to track the yeah. spread of the disease and so on and there's always been a bit of a generational thing on this of some people being happy to use well, their data and yeah, i mean not. our privacy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that kind of case i mean mm -hmm. i don't want to comment on whether it was mm -hmm. success or not you know mm -hmm. but 
But the point is, in that kind of case, you're not talking about identity, you're talking about credentials. And I, I'm very mm -hmm. much in favour of moving to credentials based environments. There's mm -hmm. a world of difference between going to the pub mm -hmm. and the pub saying, who are you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But using yeah. your identity as a proxy yeah. to go into some other database to get mm -hmm. some other information they need. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a world of difference between that and the pub saying, prove that you've been Proving vaccinated. You, yeah, prove you've been vaccinated. You know, yeah. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And, and so I think... Yeah. And like I said, I think we have the technologies to do that. Mm -hmm. What we don't yet have is some of the regulatory structures around yeah, that. But, yeah. but I can see the idea of a, a, you know, I mean, none of us want a national identity scheme. That's, <laughs> no, no, it's, no, a, no. it's a, it's a, you know, we see that as emblematic of continental tyranny. <laughs> and uh, and this goes back to the time of Napoleon. But um, a national entitlement scheme, that's a very different proposition. Yeah. If I could prove the necessary things about myself, I'm over 18, I'm allowed to get on this bus or whatever it is yeah, yeah. Uh, without disclosing without personal disclosing, information. Yeah, that, I think that's yeah. a different proposition. So I think yeah. we can see ways forward there. Sure. I and mean, we've got a very interesting question there about anonymity. It's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit small here. So I think we've, yeah. we've answered that. Gerard Lyons has answered a question that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, are any of the speakers, I think this is from Austin here, any of the speakers, I think this is in favour of a digital dollar. It's the last speaker, which was you, David, indicated that you might it might be a desirable thing but i mean i think we should ask diego to comment a bit first because of course diego is not standing yeah, sure. here yeah. on, on the screen yeah. diego any comments on privacy and then do you think a digital dollar is a desirable thing um i don't have any further comments on privacy i would think it's a a very significant feature of any cbdc and i think also any viable private digital currency would have to offer lots of privacy as far as the consumer's information that isn't required for knowing your customer regulations and anti-money laundering and things like that is concerned. If you look at the responses to the ECB's consultation on the digital euro, privacy was by far the most important concern of all the respondents. And granted, about 50% of the submissions came from Germany, but even that indicates just how the, the, the way a lot of individuals feel about this. And I don't think it just applies to the EU, it may be more pronounced there. Um, the euro area is also more cash based. So I think it's an important feature that, that should be preserved. And there are lots of ways in which you can integrate the information collection while keeping a lot of the transaction data private for other purposes. Um, on the digital dollar, I, I'm not sure that I see the commercial or the public interest for that matter, need for a digital dollar right now. The US does have a significant unbanked problem. Lots of people without bank accounts. A lot of that has to do with the fact that it's expensive to maintain a bank account. Some people don't like banks, they find them too expensive. And some people face constraints, for example, when they live in border areas, the banks there are under particular scrutiny from, for anti-money laundering reasons. And so they're reluctant to give people bank accounts. That's a persistent problem in America. The share of people without a bank account is declining. A lot of the justification for a digital dollar came from that. I'm not sure that for other purposes, such as submitting stimulus funds, which was a big concern during COVID-19, you need a public bank account option so that everyone can get their funds. It, you know, The funds actually made it through uh, relatively quickly to most households. It took longer for some because it was delivered by check, but I'm not sure that that is enough of a justification for the Federal Reserve to set up a separate infrastructure. That's how I'm interpreting the concept of a digital dollar. Um, I do see a lot of um, reasons for expanding the range of institutions that are allowed to have an account with a central bank. In America, it's only commercial banks at the moment, and you have to be a bank in order to be entitled to a master account at the Federal Reserve. I think there's a case for expanding that to e-money institutions and digital wallets when properly regulated. They don't have the concept of e-money in America, but they have the commercial institution. They're licensed at the state level. I think in that way, you could make it easier for people to use financial services who haven't got bank accounts. The point, the, 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 my comment about digital dollars is not particularly we know whether I think a digital dollar is desirable, but it's the real consumer preference. If you, I mean, a, a good benchmark is Venezuela. Venezuela is always held up by the Bitcoin people as, you know, Venezuela shows something about Bitcoin. I can't remember what exactly, mm. but but the point is, I think I'm right in saying a sixth of retail transactions in Caracas are done using Zelle, which is the US domestic instant payment mm. system. You know, the, 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 the El Salvadorian uh, on the Clapham omnibus doesn't want uh, some funny internet money. He wants dollars. Mm. 
And so it seems to me that whatever I think about dollars is irrelevant because the revealed preference of six out of the seven billion people on earth mm. is for digital dollars. So mm. once there's a viable digital dollar, it seems to me we, unstoppable. We're, like we're using different definitions, David. I, I'm not saying that transferring money electronically from bank account to bank account denominated in dollars is not something that people want. But digital dollar specifically means a CBDC issued by the Fed. That's the way I interpret it. That's, that's the way the term has been used. No, in the and I agree with that you. I'm involved in. I, I agree with you. I think if, if there is a if there is a, a digital dollar, whether it's issued by the Fed or by I don't know, Apple or Google or somebody, it doesn't matter. Um, but if there is a if there is a digital dollar that people anywhere in the world can use on their phones, I, I would have thought its momentum is pretty significant. I mean, it's going to be hard to compete against that. Yeah, I I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think that um, what we saw with what we're seeing with private digital dollars, because they are nearly all dollars, mm -hmm. is that actually the big issue was what the structure of the assets underlying that um, uh, that that backing for the dollar actually were. And you saw Teller get into a lot of problems like mm -hmm. that. And I, I think that's that's where I, I mean, my own view is, and intriguingly in the UK at the moment, you couldn't really see a reason why not, um, is that the obvious thing for a digital sterling to hold, private digital sterling, mm -hmm. would be reserves at the central bank. You can you can get an account under certain circumstances and you might have to, put, but if you only held reserves, then in a sense, almost what's a national digital currency going to add to that? Exactly. And that was kind of like the, the Bank of England's approach, really, wasn't it, when they did their paper, because they had the layered and the architecture mm -hmm. options where that, you know, if you're going to have reserves that you might as well have an account, well, whether you're a, yeah. a wallet, a PIP, uh, a, a commercial, you know, a commercial bank doing it, you might as well link that yeah. directly back to the, to, to the account. I mean, if you're not going to do that, you have a synthetic one. Which goes all the way back anyway, and then and then and then there's no there's, there's no real gain to be had in in that. Um, this is quite an interesting point because if if we take these examples that we've used of you know being able to transfer money, we're talking about really retail use here yeah. on the phone of of CBDCs or something like a, a sovereign digital currency being transferred. This will inevitably have implications. And if we read Jared Lyons' question there, right at the bottom about your final point, Brandon, about convertibility and what this means in the case of China. Yeah. There are clearly, I mean, if, you know, we use the term Cold War, arms race, uh, a, a race to be there first. What is this going to look like? Um, uh, do you want to elaborate a bit more on that, Brandon? Because well, you posed the question at the, yeah. end of your, at the end of your talk there. I, I believe that the momentum for a international digital remind me, mm -hmm. is actually almost entirely political. Mm -hmm. um, but it does have big connections to trade mm -hmm. because America, oh, sorry, China is already the biggest trading nation on earth. Mm -hmm. you know? And so anything you or I want to buy from China, we could buy through Alipay. Mm -hmm. If it's sort of had a somewhat more nationalistic you know, a remit than it does today, so you buy through that, you could keep an account in remind me. It has an interesting aspect to it that why would you not, if one you had full convertibility, why should I not have full convertibility? I want to buy stuff from China. I buy it in dollars normally anyway, so now I buy it in room. I wouldn't want to buy it in a currency that was devalued. Mm -hmm. Watch what's happening to China's monetary policy. It's starting to move towards a hard remimbi, not a soft remimbi. Do you think this is connected to the I think role this, of digital currencies? I think yeah. it is. Yeah, I think okay. it's connected to the growing role of China and yeah. and. But it serves so I suppose the digital what, as, as, very well. as, as you look ahead, you want to see the point where if it is used internationally at that yeah. point, you haven't got a artificially yeah. or a artificially remember, devalued. Remember currency. what I was saying about yeah. sterling and the dollar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah? mm -hmm. it's the same issue, but digitized. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is where the digit it's actually some of these problems mm -hmm. are old. It was that it, the UK had to pursue a hard sterling mm -hmm. to keep it as a currency that was the basis of international trade. Mm -hmm. But then the dollar yeah. has to stay hard. To stay exactly. Close. Well, that's exactly what I was, what I was about. Have uh, to be hard. Exactly what I was about yeah. to ask you. I mean, surely any any US policymaker would also face the same conundrum yeah. because you would need to find. So, I mean, so this this then automatically takes us well, 
eventually takes us back to the special drawing right solution or something similar or to something that. similar in a in a but this is all a bit theoretical yeah. now i think yeah. isn't it? i know we're in a university so we're allowed to be a bit yeah. theoretical <laughs> but D diego do you have any thoughts on that i mean yeah, i don't think you can see uh, gerard lyon's question but it was about uh, convertibility to, to china and the role of the dollar um i have my doubts about a digital yuan having any appeal outside of china where the pboc can enforce its deployment and acceptance by merchants, it can subsidize acceptance as well. And the reasons are that I, I don't think the renminbi is right now in the position to become a reserve currency. Don't think people trust the Chinese central bank as having the independence that they can rely on its monetary policy for the future. There are capital controls as well, which make it difficult. And there's path dependency because the dollar is so dominant. But I also think if we're moving into a world in which transaction data is ever more important, the fact that the PBOC intervened against Alipay and WeChat Pay to effectively collect transaction data from them. They were concerned about a lot of transactions at the PBOC settlement level, not showing what the transactions had been for, just showing as Alipay or WeChat Pay. The fact that they intervened to change that and to favor the state-owned banks as opposed to Alipay and WeChat Pay, I think that would give pause to a lot of people internationally to adopt it. So I, I think I see the dollar is very strong in that regard, whether it becomes more or more digitized or not. And I don't see a digital yuan taking off outside of the People's Republic of China. Diego, do you think though that the the um, the digital yuan um, sphere of influence, if you like, couldn't extend along the Belt and Road? I mean, I, I understand your point. In in order for in order for the yuan to challenge the US as the reserve currency, um, it needs a lot more than a digital version. It needs, you know, it needs, you know, courts and a rule of law and financial institutions and all those other things that go to make the dollar so desirable. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't have a substantial fraction of, of the trade along the Belt and Road. And I think that does open up some interesting possibilities because many of those countries along the Belt and Road have rather weak currencies and institutions. And, and you know, I think I, I can't help but feel a lot of their citizens would actually be quite happy to use a digital mm. one instead. I, I think that's right. Um, that I, I have no, no, no real objection to that, particularly because it's, it's two way trade. So I think they can be confident that all of the people accepting the yuan that they can pay for goods and services that they import with it. I just don't know how bigger share of global GDP that would end up representing. I mean, it's it's ever increasing, but it's a bit like dollarized, you know, I think with dollarized countries, it's even stronger, but even the countries that are dollarized, they tend to be relatively small GDP, very dependent on remittances and foreign yeah. payments. You yeah. don't even see it in, in, in say, larger South American economies, no matter how well connected they are with the US. Thank you, Diego. I mean, I, I think uh, one of the points on this is the role of the dollar and how it's an international currency isn't just one thing it's invoices it's remittances it's um the the, the rule of law it's also wholesale banking uh, settlement and th th we haven't really spoken about some of the so, so, some of the um so, some of the, the wholesale banking side of things i mean diego you spoke of, about the bank of england you said you expected a cbdc to be um a reality uh, possibly in the bank of england or an, another central bank uh, uh in the um in, in in the near future um when you were saying that were you talking about a, a retail cbdc a digital pound that uh, you can use in the shop and have on your phone or were you talking about the omnibus account and some of the other more innovative things that have been done on the settlement side I was talking mainly about a, um, a retail CBDC. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's there's a lot of momentum behind it. I think there are lots of arguments for having something like that. Mm -hmm. the, to me, the main benefit of, of a CBDC infrastructure would be in facilitating third party access to the central bank infrastructure mm -hmm. so that it's no longer banks that have this privileged access to uh, central bank settlement accounts because it's more and more people, yeah. more exactly. and more people are making payments using mm -hmm. third parties and e-money is an alternative that you've got, but it, it doesn't fulfill all of people's financial needs. So you can bridge that gap, I think, more easily if you upgrade the infrastructure so that a lot of different providers can connect and and you you transfer funds digitally and you don't even have to hold them on the on the central bank balance sheet. They could be intermediated and, and prudentially regulated, I think. Yeah, and that's been one of the things that's been innovative about how 
the central bank and certainly the uh, group that Catherine Braddock and John Cunliffe um, are running on that have done, have been, I suppose, more open towards the idea of some sort of stablecoin solution or CBDC solution, which allows uh, uh, non-bank actors to be part of the um, money landscape. And that's something which... Um, which we should do, which you don't see from all central banks. I suppose I would query whether um, non a digital a digital pound is is that close though. The, the, the yeah. point the mm. point about mm. non bank actors mm -hmm. was that um, uh, along this sort of innovation line is that banking and and to go back to the point that was raised earlier on is about credit essentially. Um, I, I can't see any central bank anywhere that will want to disrupt the credit markets by allowing central bank digital currency to become a substitute for, for bank deposits. I just I can't. I mean, although theoretically, mm -hmm. I, I, I just can't see it. No, no, nobody would do that. A more likely outcome, I would thought, is um, uh, Diego just said earlier on, you know, the, the US has no concept of electronic money. That's correct. It, the, the European categories of payment institution, electronic money institution, are, I think, quite good regulatory responses yeah. to separate yeah. the management of payments and getting payments into retail markets and making payments easy for people, separating that from the systemically risky aspects of credit. So yeah. I, I would think that a more likely outcome will be that in the US, when the squabbling about the sort of OCC national bank charter and whatever is over, mm. the idea of some sort of national non-bank charter, you know, along the lines of yeah. a payment institution, yeah. Yeah. Um, is a more likely fintech slash regtech response. Yeah. So mm. I, I feel quite, uh, I, we don't have it at the moment, but yeah. I feel quite positive it will come in the future. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. The, the only thing I would say is the logical extent, sort of, uh, and it's, mm. this is not a kind of, this is going to happen tomorrow morning, mm. but the logical extension maybe of digitizing the currency mm -hmm. is that banks become credit insurers mm -hmm. rather than credit institutions. Mm -hmm. So somebody provides the credit, mm -hmm. the, the bank you mean insures private companies, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the bank insures it. Mm -hmm. Or a bank takes its job as being an insurance company that insures credit. Right. So mm -hmm. I get my car loan mm -hmm. from Apple. Yeah. But, and Barclays manages well, the risk and Barclays identity. Insure, no, yeah. that's, that's the logic. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. Apple, Apple, you know, if you look at, like, I already have signed in with yeah. Apple on my phone and it's yeah. great. Yeah. So Apple Apple already want to authenticate me. Yeah. What yeah. they don't want are these liabilities associated with identifying me. Yeah. And if Barclays would take that on mm. for money, mm. um, Apple has an awful lot of money that, mm. it could, that it could lend out to people like me to buy cars. Yeah. yeah. Instead of earning treasuries on it, yeah, you know? and yeah, and that, that and that changes changes the model a little bit. Diego, just going back to the digital um, pound uh, uh, thing, do you agree with what David just said there about the roles of banks remaining central? I mean, when we look at it, no policymaker would ever put deposit taking banks at risk. I mean, they're just the 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 concept of what could go wrong is is too far reaching, um, but. When you look at the um, Bank of England paper, when you look at how they talk about the layered architecture, when you look at other non-bank actors coming into the frame and, and, and the building on top, which you uh, described there, where do the where do the banks sit in there? Let's take the, just the UK as an example. Where do the commercial deposit-taking banks sit in, in in that example, Diego? Well, I think they're very worried to begin with because they see themselves as, and, and I think to an extent rightly, as being the target of enormous prudential regulations, lots of compliance competition obligations about making um, account information available to third parties, in the UK in particular. And, uh, and they don't see countervailing measures to help them compete with the new players. So they see themselves as a sale, as losing the customer relationship they've had for a long time. I, I agree with David that the disruption is a major concern in discussions of of a digital pound or any other CBDC. But the Bank of England is doing modeling to try and see what the impact actually would be and how it can mitigate it. So they, they released a paper at, at the beginning of June that found that the transfer, the flows into CBDCs from commercial bank accounts, even if that's quite high levels and sustained levels, I think we assume sort of 10 to 15 to 20%, that it would have a relatively small impact on the cost of credit. Now, these models are always susceptible to the assumptions that one is making, but it shows that they are a little bit sanguine about that. And there are other considerations, as far as I'm aware, and maybe Chris, you have from your conversations, you have a different take, but my sense is that they're thinking about, for example, remuneration 
can mm -hmm. commercial banks remunerate in a better way to keep depositors attracted? Obviously, deposits will remain insured. I don't think there's any expectation that the creation of a CBDC would make bank deposits effectively less safe in any in any noticeable way than than a CBDC. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that would also mitigate some of that. But across the cycle, particularly when there's a loss of confidence, I think you could have a sort of digital bank run, which could be a concern. And I, as it happens, I'm not as sanguine as perhaps the bank is on the impact on credit markets, particularly on credit allocation, because I think it's easy for the central bank to do open market operations with securities and so on. But SME credit, which banks do so well, particularly in Europe, is one that is tricky, where underwriting at the individual level is important. And I don't think that that could easily just be substituted for either in the capital markets or by a third party institution or, or anything like that. So I think the allocation could be affected in quite a major way. Well, you, you make me think about two things by, by saying that, Diego. So the first is in, in areas where open banking has introduced more competition uh, into the market. So in the UK, it, it, it is in that SME area. And, and certainly using transactional data in order to do better risk management for mm. SMEs mm. has turned out to be quite effective. Mm. So, so I think you're absolutely right about that. To, to the point about the, um, the impact on the bank deposits, the ECB proposal, if I remember correctly, is that wallet balances will be limited at about 3,000 euros or something like that, right? So, so presumably a, a simple limit would be sufficient to mitigate that problem yeah thank you all gentlemen we are almost out of time i'm going to ask you each one question um which i will ask you to keep the answer as short as possible and this is we've spoken about the means of payment and about how a digital currency might look how a cbdc might look um i want to know what the best possible monetary policy improvement the best po possible monetary policy tool could come out of digital currencies, sovereign di di digital currencies existing. Diego, um, I'll, I'll turn to you first, and I just want you to think it, it doesn't have to be programmable money or anything like that. It could be anything. Any uh, policy, particularly monetary policy outcome or tool that will be improved in the hands of policymakers as a result of a digital currency. Over to you, Diego, first. Thank you. Um, I think potentially monetary transmission could be improved. There's been, there have been concerns about the zero lower bound and the effective lower bound in recent years in terms of getting monetary stimulus through. And I think there are high hopes that moving into CBDCs makes it easier for negative interest rates effectively to be passed on. Um, potentially also, I think you could get, a, by having a wider variety of entities connected directly with the central bank, you could improve the prudential supervision of the whole financial system and we would face fewer instances in which we come across institutions that fail and were outside the perimeter because there was no oversight of what was going on. So I think from a potential perspective that could also improve things if you, if you expand access. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, well, I think, um, I think I'd quite like to see a government dashboard Mm -hmm. I think that would be a good idea. So because at the moment, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has absolutely no idea what's going on in the economy and, and only gets a very vague idea about two years later when mm -hmm. the revisions are finished. So if there was a digital currency, then the Chancellor could wake up in the morning and pull something up on his phone, uh, which would tell him like exactly how much money was spent in the economy yesterday. And you could bring in all the data from Visa and MasterCard mm -hmm. and the digital currency. Um, and then he would know, you know how things are going. Um, sector by sector. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. that you know, I, I noticed that the um, the uh, you know the idea of now casting has become kind of you know more more current in in economics. Mm -hmm. So this idea that digital currency would actually help to give a much better picture of what was going on in the economy, I think is rather interesting. And I, I haven't seen it in any of those mm -hmm. reports I was looking at. So no, yes, I, I I think you've gone. I think that's an incredibly important point because I think there's two there's there's two things I stuck in, in in mind, which is you know helicopter money and negative interest rates. Okay, I think we all kind of get those. Mm -hmm. But the thing that we've done commercially is big data and big analytics, mm -hmm. and we can do that today. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's telling us a vast amount about our um, our bit of the economy, the bank's bit or the um, or Apple's bit or 
whoever's bid. You know, you can look at your part of the economy. When you stand back from that and look at the tool, macroeconomic tools and models that are still being used, one, they're antiquated, two, they're wrong. Um, it's extremely difficult to see how on earth a central bank or a treasury actually manages an economy with the tools it's got, because the tools are awful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can like, only get better. Like commercial terms, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in the sort of, when you yeah. translate into commercial yeah. terms, there has been no change. Yeah, oh, no, the tools have been yeah. blunt, I think, in, in, yeah. in the extreme. Yeah. And, but, but, it, but, but they we'll, haven't changed since yeah. I was at university. But will this, how will this but help in sharpen this world? It would be yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. It? yeah, because yeah. It's, yeah, like, yeah. you could it's start like using a, these tools. In a, in a modern yeah. economy, it seems mm. like surely the Chancellor should be able to press a button and find out. Well, how much was sold in supermarkets yesterday? Was yeah. it up or well, down? the supermarkets all know. Well, they know. Yeah, the Chancellor doesn't. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? I mean, we've done it all. The com- commercial industry is already there. Exactly. I mean, this is nothing well, I certainly think the role of data here will yeah. be could be the most transformative thing over and above the, the some of the other tools we've spoken about. Sure. Right, uh, Diego, thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much. No, thank you. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's very been a fascinating discussion. Thanks. Please do tune in again at 2 p.m. UK time. Um, um, for the next uh, session, which will be um, w- 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 which will be yeah, starting at two o'clock, so time for a, a short lunch break. But thank you all very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Audience.
yes. Let's familiarize ourselves with the screen now. The first screen, I'm expecting Matthias to be there. Yes, look at your speaker. Oh no, that's uh, how loud, loud you want it. And maybe you'll your speaker, whether you want it on or off. So if they can't hear you, that may, maybe your speaker that it's off. No, this one is the mute. We yeah. haven't muted it. No. So if you want to mute it right now, no, we are talking. I, no, I don't just okay. I just want to see if... Uh, okay. There's is. one person who's chatting. Yeah. Oh, uh, Gail, uh, Kevin, I think I can hear you. I'm not sure, but not yeah. sure, right? With... We'll be able to chat. Yeah. Everything is on now, basically, just to wait until Matthias comes back online again. You can write to him there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks, Melo. Kevin, can you hear me? Oh, I think I see Jason. Good afternoon. Hello there, Jason. Can you copy me? Yes, I copy loud and clear. Brilliant. Kevin, can you hear me too? Ah, I can't unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, Kevin, hello. Sure. Right, Steph. So we can see and hear each other. That's the three of us. We don't need any anything else to succeed. Uh, very good. Welcome, everybody. That's great. I, I don't think we've, we've, we're fully live yet. I'm not sure how the...
Ben. So, welcome to the second session on, uh, of our conference, this one on central bank digital currencies and specifically on the impact on government financing and monetary policy. And may I introduce uh, Matthias Kleis, the, the chairman of this uh, second session. He's an economist and policy advisor with a track record in uh, digital finance, fintech regulation, and the green economy. He chairs the scientific advisory board of Eurocrowd.org, the European crowdfunding uh, network, and he's a past president of the Scottish Economic Society. He has been the inaugural director of the Vincent Center, dean of the University of Dundee School of Business, and head of Kiel Management School, and has a, a, a record of uh, working with the European Commission, local enterprise partnerships, the UK Department of Health, and a number of think tanks and charities. He has held honorary uh, professorial and visiting positions at diff different universities in, in Europe and the US, including, uh, including uh, Rotterdam, Dundee, Duke, Witten Herdeke, and Buckingham. So uh, please, uh, Matthias, the, the floor is entirely yours to introduce the, the second panel. Thank you very much. Um, Jan, many thanks for these very kind words of introduction. Um, uh, also from my part, a, a warm welcome, no pun intended, uh, to uh, this afternoon's uh, proceedings uh, from the Scottish Highlands, as it turns out in my case, uh, to this hybrid event, uh, which uh, I should say uh, attending this morning session has turned out rather well in terms of how we blend the technologies and, and the live uh, Q&As. Uh, so, so many thanks for the organizers facilitating all that uh, to those fascinating and, and pressingly important topics. So uh, the topic of this afternoon's session, the political economy of central bank digital currency uh, with two papers this afternoon. In the morning, we had two papers by Brandon Davis and uh, Diego Zuluaga, um, which were in extremely interesting, but seemed to say, OK, but more or less, uh, once all that innovation takes place, it's business as usual, certainly for central banks and, and for regulators once they've adapted. Uh, one paper by David Burge uh, was a bit more upbeat on, on the radical changes that uh, might lie ahead and might catch us uh, and regulators, policymakers out. So for this afternoon, uh, I think that theme will continue. The first paper um, uh, on central bank money, liability asset or equity of the nation, a fundamental conceptual questions presented by Jason Allen. Uh, welcome, uh, Jason. And it's a paper uh, co-authored by a, a whole range of other authors. So uh, it strives of ex multidisciplinary expertise. Jason is a senior research fellow at Humboldt University Berlin, uh, has uh, trained as a lawyer, is specializing in the legal, legal impact of new monetary technologies. And that will be followed by uh, the second paper uh, by Kevin Dowd on the political economy of central bank digital currencies towards a techno-fascist dystopia uh, is the new title, I should say. So we're also looking forward to that second paper. Uh, Kevin is a professor of finance and economics at the University of Durham. Uh, he has, as many uh, in, in the session will know, has published extensively on free banking and the rise of cryptocurrencies for many years now. Uh, personally, I remember us, Kevin, uh, discussing uh, the latest ins and outs and innovations 10 years ago uh, in a cellar bar, a Dundonian cellar bar. So, so I'm very much looking forward to that second paper as well. Um, uh, Kevin also runs the Umeos blog, which I can commend to everybody. It's a counterfoil to that Bank Underground blog, the official blog of the Bank of England, as you may know. So uh, we will hear both papers after uh, each other. Uh, followed as before by Q&A. Um, for Q&As, you can type them in as we go along and I would encourage you to do so, so that I can familiarize myself with your questions or comments. Um, if uh, organizationally, uh, if you're not in the room with your real life name, it might help if you put that into brackets. Um, and if you uh, type a Q&A, uh, keep them short uh, because it's then easier for me to read them out and to present to uh, our, our, our authors. Without further ado, uh, uh, we are now coming to the first paper. Uh, Jason, over to you, please. 
Fantastic. Matthias, uh, thank you very much. I'll uh, just share my um, screen. I think, there we go. So bear with me for just a moment. Here we are. A year and a half of uh, pandemic lockdowns and um, we're finally getting the hang as, uh, as technology lawyers of, uh, of screen sharing on, uh, on Zoom. So thanks very much for the kind uh, invitation. It's lovely to, uh, to meet you, um, albeit in this format, perhaps next time we'll, we'll get to meet in person. Um, as, as Matthias mentioned, this, this paper um, is, is a joint effort um, between myself, <clears throat> um, Michael Kumhoff, who's a senior research economist at the Bank of England, Rosa Lastra, who's uh, the Sir John Lubbock Chair in uh, Banking Law at Queen Mary University Centre for Commercial Legal Studies, um, Will Bateman, who's at the Australian National University in Canberra, Simon Gleeson, um, who's a partner at Clifford Chance LLP in London, um, and also, uh, I think, um, has a position at the CCLS, and Saula Omarova, um, who is a professor of law at Cornell. Um, many of their reputations sort of uh, precede them, so... Um, I, I won't spend too much time introducing any of my co-authors, um, but this paper itself is the product of a collaboration um, under the project Rebuilding Macroeconomics, <clears throat> which was an ESRC-funded project um, at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research um, in London. And our brief was basically to look for interdisciplinary impulses, in this case from law, um, to stimulate sort of new thinking in macroeconomics and to en enhance that discipline's policy relevance. So, um, you know, it would seem tendentious for me uh, as, as, as a lawyer. Um, you know, Michael was our uh, economist in, in residence and Rosa has, has worked extensively um, at the interface between law and economics. And it was really a very exciting opportunity to sit down, you know, in a room over a period of time with uh, like-minded people from different jurisdictions and also different disciplines and um, to think long and hard about a fairly fundamental question, which is the characterization for legal, for accounting, and also for economic purposes of central bank money. And it's a pleasure to, to present it today. We have presented this paper um, before. It's currently in working paper form and it is available on SSRN. Um, each time we present it, um, something new has, has come up. And so I very much look forward to uh, the Q&A and discussion um, following Kevin's, uh, Kevin's paper today. And, you know, the background we know, central bank balance sheets have, you know, really expanded pretty radically in, in you know, certainly in, in my adult lifetime, I finished law school in 2007. Um, and so all of, all of this um, has been on the one hand, just situation normal for me um, as, as, a, uh, as a citizen um, and also as a researcher. Um, but of course, these are, these are not really normal times in, in which we live um, and unconventional monetary policy has been really characteristic um, of monetary policy since, since that time. Unconventional monetary policy really does um, underline the importance of a proper theoretical understanding of central bank money, especially of central bank reserves. Um, you know, now we are beginning to have a mature sort of critical reflection on, you know, QE uh, with more than a decade of QE behind us. Um, and there's a new sort of urgency and topicality to this debate because uh, although there are very different sort of models proposed for central bank digital currency, um, you know, really they all, they all, uh, implicate central bank balance sheets, or at least raise the question, 
what, what, what are these, you know, what are these monetary units going to be? Um, are they somehow akin to digital banknotes? Are they somehow, you know, akin to uh, reserves perhaps held by households and firms um, and other participants in, in the real economy? Um, and, you know, it's a long-standing interest of mine whenever we have a new category of thing um, or of, of uh, financial and monetary phenomenon um, to characterize, it really puts, puts strain on our existing or on the definitions of our existing categories. And so I think, you know, CBDC and the rise of CBDC, um, you know, shines a light back on <clears throat> our understanding or lack thereof of central bank reserves and, and of banknotes and, uh, and coin. There's, at least from the legal perspective, there is a really surprising lack of clarity on the legal basis of, uh, of central bank reserve creation. So on a related project together with, with Will Bateman, um, we've got a forthcoming paper in the Modern Law Review, which uh, surprisingly really is the first to look uh, in detail expressly at the law of central bank reserve creation. Um, and, and that's, that's in, in, in my respectful view, somewhat problematic um, that that's only happened um, now. Um, but but that's, that's the situation that there is. Um, this notwithstanding, we've got a broad assumption that central bank money, both bank notes and reserves are straightforwardly liabilities of the central bank. And, you know, that's, that's what, what I would characterize as the conventional wisdom. Um, it certainly is the accounting treatment in um, various manuals of various important national and international institutions and organizations. And although that strays beyond my sort of area of, uh, of expertise and or comfort, um, there are really numerous implications for macroeconomic theory um, and also for monetary policy that flow from how we, how we characterize central bank money. Some of those are discussed in the paper. Um, in this presentation, I will sort of focus on the core argument and on the sort of legal contribution to that argument. Um, perhaps some of these monetary policy um, and methodological questions will come up in the, in, in the Q&A, but I would encourage um, those interested to, to look at the paper and, and engage with, with that. And uh, I'd be interested to hear, to hear those views. So our argument is uh, pretty straight, well, it's fairly straightforward. Central bank money is not a liability of the central bank and we shouldn't talk about it as if it were. Um, however, the problem is central bank money doesn't really fit straightforwardly, comfortably, neatly, easily into the other sort of major accounting categories either. Um, and that, you know, raises a bit of an open question. Um, in our view though, we see central bank money, um, especially reserves as really a piece of public financial infrastructure. Um, its main functions are to tie commercial banks, which have, you know, the main um, money creation role in our monetary system, um, you know, into this sort of hierarchical uh, monetary order. And they provide um, central banks with a really important instrument of monetary policy. Um, the, the question was raised in a previous presentation of this, of this argument, you know, do we need to rewrite the textbooks? And I think I answered somewhat timidly there. Um, my co-author, Michael, uh, said yes, definitely. Um, and so I think we do need to recalibrate some of the conventional wisdom. And that's going to require... Um, you know, interdisciplinary uh, communication really between the disciplines with skin in the game, which are at least law, economics and accounting. Our argument sort of builds along certain uh, what I've called fault lines in the literature. So from the uh, economics background, we discuss a paper by Archer and Moser Boehm from 2013 um, that, you know, really stress the perpetual nature of central bank uh, money, um, 
that stress, you know, the unique uh, sort of role and mandate of central banks um, and really the limited relevance of conventional accounting frameworks to central banks' success or failure in, in that mandate um, and, and also underline central banks' money creation power and, and their sort of um, low insolvency risk. Um, and they argue that really we should not treat central bank uh, money as, uh, as liabilities. Um, we should treat them more akin or analogous to equity. Um, Dyson and Hodgson, who you'll know from the positive money um, uh, movement in the UK, make a similar argument in 2016 in fairly condensed form. Um, and by reference to, you know, accounting standards say that central bank money should also rather be accounted for as equity. From the accounting literature, Bossone et al. from 2018, um, make, make an argument. They sort of identify the source of the mistake with law and, uh, and, and pin that on, on the legal discipline, um, which I don't entirely uh, agree with. Um, but they say it's odd that, uh, you know, central bank money is accounted for as a liability, especially because it, it sort of accrues this seniorage income and they make certain arguments about where that same seniorage income ought to, ought to accrue within the organised political community. Our approach is, um, is in keeping with the, the brief uh, that we accepted. Um, it really stresses the role of law. And we say that, you know, before we talk about any kind of accounting identity or any sort of category um, within accounting methods, um, they all refer constitutively um, to some sort of legal object. So a liability um, is an accounting concept, but that accounting concept refers to a pre-existing um, legal entity or object, namely a liability. Um, so, you know, we sort, of, we sort of make the claim that, look, law plays a constitutive role here. And if we go back and we look at the uh, sort of legal substratum on which accounting and economics are, uh, categories build that will allow us to reason through from first principles and potentially arrive at a more satisfactory uh, satisfactory position. The idea that central bank uh, reserves in particular, but central bank money more broadly, um, is straightforwardly a liability of the central bank, um, really is a function of a failure to transcend um, the gold standard when banknotes were redeemable and when commercial banks actually had to sort of deposit things in reserve, there was a legal relationship between the central bank and the commercial bank um, that, that bore the legal indicia of, of a liability. Um, you know, those, those conditions no longer obtain. Um, and, you know, in effect, central bank money of all kinds is a self-referential loop with no terminus, as, as we describe it. Thinking about central bank money, therefore, um, you know, by reference to commercial bank money is, is quite misleading and inaccurate. If we look at the um, IFRS, for example, we see a liability as a present obligation of the entity to transfer an economic resource as a result of past events. We have, you know, definitions of equity and asset um, that will be familiar to everybody. An asset is a present economic resource, which may be a right, even if that right does not correspond to a liability in, in another party. Um, and then equity is really assets minus liabilities and whatever is, is, is residual. Um, there, if we connect the dots, there's um, fairly broad support for the proposition that central bank money is not and cannot be a straightforward liability of the central bank. Um, I've omitted references here, but they're all in, in the paper which is available on SSRN. Um, you know, so Boyder says, look, doesn't need to be redeemed. Um, and 
you know, really it's only a claim on the issuer for the same amount in its, you know, of itself. So I can take my old 20 pound bill and I can get a new crisp 20 pound bill, but there's nothing else that I can, I can be paid in. You know, my co-author Simon Gleason, um, whose recent work, The Legal Concept of Money, um, is, is definitely worth a read for those interested in virtual currencies in particular, says, look, it's really questionable whether it's a claim at all, um, again, because you'd be exchanging one claim against the central bank for another identical claim against the central bank. Um, the great, the late great F.A. Mann, um, was maybe a little bit more circumspect, but he was a very conservative thinker uh, across the board. Um, but he said, really, yeah, this is a promise to pay, which could only be discharged by, you know, giving an equivalent promise to pay. And this is a curious state of affairs because the note is at once the promise to pay and, and money. And again, we have this self-referential loop. He in turn cites Carl Oliver Kroner, who was a wonderful Swedish, Legal theorist, also a bit of a Nazi sympathizer, which is, is uh, you know, a, a danger with, with the territory in mid-century legal theory. But he makes the excellent point in a concise but uh, generally neglected book, The Problem of the Monetary Unit. Um, and he says, look, these claims are always good because they can never be honored. Um, and again, really what this suggests is that from the legal point of view, we are not talking about a straightforward liability um, on anybody's terms. And, uh, and we shouldn't talk about central bank money as a straightforward liability. The next category we sort of go and, and, and move to in, you know, a fairly, uh, a fairly intuitive process of elimination is, is an asset. There is a prima facie plausible argument that central bank reserves are, are an asset of the commercial bank, which holds them. Um, there's also an argument that a central bank money may be an asset of the central bank itself. From the legal perspective, we discussed this and, and this is plausible, but again, doesn't, doesn't really quite fit. Um, there are issues which I won't, I won't discuss. Um, uh, with, with this sort of characterization from, uh, from an, an economics perspective. Um, and so we conclude it's not really straightforwardly an asset either. Now, unfortunately, you know, these arguments to treat central bank reserves sort of in a manner analogous to, for example, corporate equity, they're also somewhat problematic because, uh, you know, if we look at the concept of equity first, it implicitly refers to the concept of an asset. Equity just is assets minus liabilities, you know, whatever is residual. Um, after that deduction has taken place. But there's also two um, concepts of, you know, there are two legal concepts or two concepts that are operating when we talk about, about equity. One is this balance sheet conception, but beneath that, um, there's an ownership uh, conception. An asset is a something that, that the entity owns, and a liability is something that the entity owes and you deduct what the entity owes from what it owns and whatever is left over um, is the equity, which is a pool of assets. Um, if we were to take this approach again, straightforwardly, there would be um, really problematic and irreconcilable conflicts with, uh, with the actual uh, corporate law, um, shareholder and ownership structures of central banks. They, they differ, but some are, you know, publicly traded and, and, and held, you know, by shareholders on the capital markets. Others are, you know, wholly government owned. But in all cases, a central bank has an owner and it would be um, odd to treat bank notes and central bank reserves as somehow a parallel uh, category of equity that would compete with the equity um, of, of shareholders under whatever corporations law or, or other um, other law of organizations or law of groups under which the relevant central bank was organized. So um, after this process of elimination, we venture a bit of a positive case, um, a bit of a positive argument in this paper. And um, we say uh, we, we can't fully endorse the treatment of central bank money straightforwardly as, as equity. Um, but we introduce uh, into the debate a concept of social equity, 
this point um, does need fleshing out in subsequent work. Um, but uh, given the fact that central bank money bears more legal indicia in common with, for example, corporate equity than it does with corporate debt, um, we, uh, we, we think that this is probably the most likely avenue for development. Um, the underlying point, which I think I'd stress here, um, and which I don't think you know, can be uh, too contentious, um, is that liability is definitely not appropriate. Um, and that whatever we're talking about, something sui generis is, is needed um, that does not transfer, you know, private bookkeeping practices, uh, you know, that, that, that may have been applicable in the gold standard um, to a piece of public financial infrastructure, which serves certain purposes and, and really operates in, in a bit of a different framework. Um, some central banks, you know, really are quite, quite candid about this. The Swiss, you know, the website of the Swiss National Bank, for example, says, look, the majority of liabilities presented. Um, so, you know, central bank reserves actually directly reflect the implementation of the bank's monetary policy, which is the provision of liquidity to or absorption of liquidity from the money market. And in virtue of its exclusive right to issue bank notes, um, and also create uh, reserves in the case of many central banks. Um, the Swiss National Bank runs no liquidity or refinancing risks um, from its liabilities in Swiss francs. Um, it's always in a position to meet its obligations. This really reflects, you know, the legal learning which, which uh, was, was cited just earlier. But there is this open question about how this type of instrument, given its uh, given its, its public purposes and its role in the monetary system um, should be accounted for. Um, so there are a lot of policy implications, which you know I, I look forward to uh, look forward to to discussing um, and and especially hearing others others' views. Um, but at least you know we identify these points. Um, the treatment of central bank money in public debt statistics needs to be uh, reconsidered. Um, calculations of government debt burdens may need to be adjusted down if uh, central bank reserves are not debt. Um, there may be broad implications for the whole debate around um, central bank money issuance, um, about that its impact on inflation, um, about the propriety and the legal permissibility um, of monetary financing. Um, especially in times of crisis, for example. Um, and there are also interesting implications for the design considerations and the accounting treatment of, of retail um, central bank digital currency. So I'll, I'll end there. Um, the link to the working paper version, um, the current draft has moved on, but this is sort of the version of record as it were. Um, is, uh, is available on SSRN. Um, and I would be, you know, very, very happy to hear from, you know, my co-panelists or, uh, or participants um, if, if, if uh, they have any, any feedback um, in addition to the Q&A session. So, Matthias, thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen. Jason, many, many thanks indeed for persuading us that we have not even understood central bank money conventionally understood. Um, what hope is there for CBDC then? I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, Kevin, uh, over to you. Thank you, Matthias. And thank you, uh, Jason. That was a splendid um, presentation. And of course, it's always difficult following such a Strong start. Um, I'll do my best. Um, by the way, I agree with you. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject, central bank accounting. Um, and we'll talk about it later on, I hope. Um, so now let's see if I can get my screen to share. Oh, yeah, got something there. Um, so um, as um, Matthias sort of mentioned, that um, my, my main interest is political economy. Uh, I'm particularly keen on free banking. And so I suppose to summarize, I've never seen a monetary policy instrument that I liked. Um, 
And um, I suppose, um, you know, as uh, I've gone over my career, I've seen one new policy instrument after another rolled out. And um, this, here I'd like to talk particularly about the political economy of central bank digital currencies. I have to say that uh, my initial thought about this was, I wonder what they're doing. Are they just trying to be hip? And I was fairly convinced when, when, when people started talking about central bank digital currencies that nobody really knew what they were doing. But it, it was a kind of a case of we better do something so that we, uh, we don't sort of uh, lose out. Um, and so basically, I never took them seriously, and partly because I just didn't understand them myself. Um, but in the last very only few weeks, really, I've come to have quite a different view. I think they're actually quite sinister. Um, so let me let me start off with um, Adam Smith uh, and this lovely quote of his about the man of system, who is apt to be very wise in his own conceit. And uh, Smith goes on to say that he seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the pieces on a chessboard. And of course, many of us have kind of used this as a starting point to laugh at central planning. But I think uh, my worry is that um, the man of system might soon have his day. And um, please forgive me if I gloss over the definition of what these things are. And just assume that the context, uh, you know, clarifies it. My, my basic argument is that there's a power grab in play, which is rapidly sweeping aside a free society, what's left of it, and most people are oblivious to it. So now, I'm not suggesting. So we're talking here about techno-fascism, and um, I'm not suggesting that the people proposing central banks are fascists, or bad people, or anything like that. But just let's go back to textbook definition. Fascism is the rule of the few. And techno-fascism means an extreme concentration of power in a handful of technocrats who can exert complete control over a subdued population and manage the great unwashed, in other words, the rest of us. Um, this involves an alliance of state and big business against the population, essentially, the broad sweep of it is to reduce us to techno, techno serfdom. Now, how many people have consciously thought this thing through? I have no idea. But one, one, one is reminded of the, you know, the great reset type of agenda. Okay. So, so my point is that the, the CBDCs are the techno fascists fantasy. Um, to me, they have no obvious social benefits to society. Um, so basically, the, the benefits to us are trivial. Um, I found a nice quote on the web, uh, Has Gomez, he says, among the many races the pandemic has accelerated, none is so pointless as the issue of CBDCs. Um, so it seems harmless enough, but then suppose a central bank has its own CBDC, then step by step, first compels everybody to use it. So we get rid of uh, substitute. Um, and then imposes other restrictions as needed. And basically you end up with a central bank with, with unlimited powers or almost unlimited powers of control. So this worries me. And, and so the, the obvious kind of analogy is with a, a Trojan horse. Okay. So the, um, the, I suppose my message is that we should not see CBDCs in purely techno terms, um, but, but in much broader terms about the balance of power in society, which are much, much more important than anything else. Well, you could sort of say that there is a techno fascist strategy. I don't want to sound too conspiratorial, but let's just suppose that there might be one. First off, we destroy financial privacy. We introduce uh, CBDCs as a boring low tech issue. Nobody pays any attention. We, we suppress crypto, we abolish cash, we establish a purely digital economy. Um, and then th the results are number one, that it enables new forms of monetary policy. And secondly, no privacy, no rights, no cash. That worries me. Who's going to control the guardians here? Um, 
the tactics would be along these lines, um, disguise a power grab by a power grab agenda by sort of techno babble, gloss over dangers and costs, numb the population with propaganda and so forth. And there's a delightful quote by Mencken that comes to mind that the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the population alarmed and hence clam clamorous to be led to safety by an endless series of hobgoblins, most of them imaginary. Then we also have the freedom trumps safety ploy, which we've seen a lot of since 9-11. And there's also the, the bad guys. You know, we need these tools to deal with all those bad guys out there and so forth. Um, the question then is, should we trust these people to use their power wisely? Um, well, to me, the answer is fairly obvious. Um, I'll give you a couple of quotes here. If you put Milton Friedman, if you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert, in five years, there'd be a shortage of sand. That captures it fairly well. But the best quote is by Sowell. He says, the most basic question is not what is best, but who shall decide what is best? Okay, so um, okay, so the potential, the enormous potential of CBDCs, I think none of us have really got our head around this. Um, Augustine Carstens recently said, the key difference with a CBDC is that the central bank will have absolute control under the rules and regulations that determine its use. So this allows a number of things. It gives increased flexibility to set interest rates. You can set differential interest rates, the power of cancellation, the, the ability to cancel anyone's money holdings, and cancellation can be partial or full and can be done in an instant. Um, the veto on any expenditure, the central bank can block or punish any expenditures of which it disapproves and uh, so forth. And in any case, uh, just mapping ahead, we can use, or they can use CBDCs to implement NERP, uh, to implement helicopter money, to implement SEDO economic policies, um, to implement MMT, to implement lockdown, and to, and to basically uh, introduce radically innovative monetary policies. Okay, so let's go through these just quickly. Um, first, we have NERP a digital version of Silvio Geisel's stamped money, which in my opinion is a bad idea. Um, my objections to it, first off, um, because it contradicts time preference. And secondly, because we want positive interest rates due to, uh, you know, as compensation for default risk and because of productivity of capital issues. Um, the, I have a question. Uh, if, We've never had negative interest rates since Hammurabi. Why, why are they a good idea now? Um, another point is that, as I understand it, NERP is pro normally proposed to stimulate the economy. But if, if NERP were implemented and banks' deposits were taxed at the NERP rate, then we basically have a tax. And so I don't see the, I don't see the stimulative side of it. Anyway, those are just objections to NERP. Um, We can use, they can use uh, CBDCs to, to implement helicopter money in very innovative, technically elegant ways. Um, you, instead of just having a helicopter drop and <laughs> dropping it from the uh, sky, uh, you, you can target it through uh, personalized accounts. Of course, that's always what I think was in mind. Um, you can target it so that the people you like get the bigger handouts. Um, so no dollar note gets wasted on the wrong recipient, if, if that's how you feel. Um, it's very, very simple to implement. So in that sense, it, it, it's technically very elegant. Um, you can use them for SEDO economics. Um, so Martin Hutchinson defines SEDO economics as the use of economic policy to punish the disfavored. It's not a new idea, um, but I've never heard of, a, of it described as such. Um, so once the government has coerced everyone into using central bank digital currency that it controls, it has absolute control over payments, and then it can control everything. Um, 
So, I mean, obviously it can block payments to or from individuals or organizations it does not like. It can go after its enemies uh, and so forth. Um, any, anybody that got on the wrong side, you know, whistleblowers, these sorts of people can be subjected to this punishment. Um, you know, some really neat uh, applications. So if you had a government dominated by health fanatics, we would be compelled to follow personalized health recommendations determined by the latest health fad. Um, similarly, environmentalist, uh, if, if, if they were in charge, they would be telling us what we can and cannot buy and so forth. Well, then if you had a theocracy, you'd have religious fanatics preventing us doing immoral things in order to save our souls. So it's, you know, lots of, lots of uses here. Um, to give you a modern example, is the Chinese social credit system, um, which essentially surveils and controls the population through individual social credit scores. Um, so good behavior is rewarded, bad behavior is punished. Bad behavior might be bad driving, loitering, smoking where you shouldn't, making frivolous purchases, uh, posting fake news. Um, punishments are many and varied, like a slowed internet connection, uh, a ban on flights, uh, having your dog taken away, blacklisting, so forth. Um, this has been described as a futuristic version of Big Brother out of control. Yeah. So, MMT. So what is MMT? Well, MMT is essentially a combination of number one, we print money to finance government spending. And number two, we only use taxes to punish whoever we want to punish. Um, so it's a combination of helicopter money and SEDO economic policy. In this case, the helicopter money payments are not distributed to the population, but they're distributed to the government, which actually, by the way, Jason, raises some fascinating um, accounting issues about you know, how we classify these, these payments. Um, we can use it as a lockdown tool. So imagine a future lockdown with this kind of um, CBDC in place. Then the government can ensure that people cannot spend outside of a certain distance from their home. They cannot spend on unapproved items. They cannot spend outside approved time. So you can only go out once a day or once a week or whatever it is. You know, can have their spending opportunities restricted if they refuse to get a jab. And it, I mean, it does sound far-fetched, but Pakistan is just currently uh, into something that is not a million miles away. Um, in Pakistan, there's a heck of a lot of lockdown skepticism. Um, and the health minister for the Punjab recently announced that anyone who refused to accept the jab would have their SIM cards disabled. Okay. And she says, we're doing all we can to compel people to get vaccinated. The government cannot allow individuals who do not want to get vaccinated because that would risk lives and so forth. And there are other restrictions also being considered. So <clears throat> now the, I suppose, most interesting aspect of this is the implications for radically new monetary policy. And I've just kind of thrown some ideas, some of which are kind of familiar and others, I don't know. Um, inflation targeting and control, you see, this is a nice one. So obviously it's very obvious. If inflation is above target, we increase the supply of CBDCs. And conversely, if inflation, whichever, have I got that right? No, I'm sorry, I've got increase, decrease the wrong way around, I apologize. When inflation exceeds target, we increase the supply of money. When it is below target, we decrease it. This sits very well with MMT, by the way, because imagine you have MMT implemented and then we have a lot of inflation. Well, then you can just cancel, uh, you can cancel a lot of those uh, balances and then you've got inflation under control. You also have the question of demand management or, or rather demand control, because if the central bank wants to boost spending, it can announce it will cancel or tax money holdings to encourage people to spend more. So you have here a, you know, a CBDC with expiry dates. It's a perfect tool to counter money hoarding. 
which is very interesting from a technical point of view. Um, so basically we can, instead of trying to manage uh, aggregate demand, we can more or less control it. Um, we can compel people to buy government approved products as well. So there's a micro side to it as well. And then you have the question of uh, central bank industrial policy. And once firms have accounts with the central bank, then they can borrow, the potential is there to borrow or lend to the central bank. And then basically we have the central bank uh, in making industrial loans and therefore we have industrial policy. We can apply differential treatments to preferred sectors or preferred clients. And already we can see that the central banks are talking about uh, central bank climate change policy. So, you know, for example, if something is ESG approved, we give it better rates in some sense. If we don't like it, like coal or diesel, then we give it adverse rates. So a lot of things there to, to, uh, to be developed. Then we have the war on cash. Well, the war on cash is essential for this agenda because we need to eliminate cash. We, we need to eliminate um, uh, competitors to central bank digital currency. If we keep cash and that we implement NERP, then everybody will flee to cash, for example. Besides which, uh, when people use cash, their, their transactions can't be uh, traced and so forth. So the, the bottom line here is that we have, we've had it for some time, the war on cash and an alliance of big payment firms and techno fascists who abolish cash as a competitor to digital. Because this ignores the benefits of cash, primarily anonymity. Um, so we have a lot of anti-cash propaganda, cash is on its way out and all this sort of stuff. Um, this ignores the fact that cash is still used for most transactions. Um, it's also, if, if cash is on its way out, then it will disappear naturally anyway. So you don't need the war on it. There's the various technically inefficient arguments, which essentially have an underlying paternalist premise that somebody else knows better uh, what we want than, than, than we, we do ourselves. So the technical efficiency of cash is only, part, is only one part of the issue here. If I use cash or you use cash, it's because there are reasons why you wanna use cash. Um, there's the bad guys argument, which is really the most perhaps common argument, but in my opinion, a really, really dumb argument. It basically says, bad guys use these things, so we should abolish them. I really don't think these people have thought this one through. Um, it, it, bad guys use the same amenities as the rest of us, so let's abolish everything. I mean, it makes no sense. Also, the bad guys use cash argument is factually flawed. Um, First of all, you know, you have images of, of people, uh, you know, with two cases of cash and so on. That's very passe. Um, the, the, your modern bad guy would use the Amazon gift cards and things like that. Um, in any case, there's clear evidence that the big, uh, let's say the, the vehicles of money laundering and all that sort of stuff are accountancy firms and banks. We had the uh, Panama Papers, for instance, and we had the lovely Dansky Bank um, scandal with a quarter of a trillion in Russian drug money or whatever it was, uh, laundered on, from under the eyes of the regulators. And meanwhile, you know, we have all this AML stuff that the rest of us have to put up with. Um, there's a nice sort of quote here. Um, I mean, Ken Rogoff's book, The Curse of Cash, um, probably, it's, the, it's the, probably the best known piece on the on the walk side and uh, Jim Grant just destroys it in his review uh, in the Wall Street Journal I think it was he said strip away the technical pretense and what you have is politics the author wants the government to control your money it's as simple as that so anyway that's the war on cash and there are other problems um you know, the cyber vulnerabilities, um, lack of access. You know, if you, if, if you have a, if the only money permitted is central bank digital currency, what about parts of the world where there's no internet access? Um, but the biggest one is that the CB, 
DC represents a single point of failure for the whole system. So take it out and the system goes down. And to give you just one example, 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico. It knocked out the grid and so all the usual digital stuff, ATMs and so on, stopped working. And people were unable to buy food and other necessities if they didn't have cash. Stores were only allowing people to pay cash. So the Fed came in and flew in a plane load of cash to meet payroll disasters and save the day. Now, my question is, what would, what would we do in a similar uh, situation if there were no cash? It's just bound to happen. And Ryan McMakin has a lovely quote. He says, in a cashless world, you'd better pray the power never goes out. Okay, so let me give a couple of case studies. Um, one of them is uh, Australia's Centrelink welfare policy, where 80% of welfare recipient welfare payments uh, were to go on a credit card so that people couldn't spend the money on booze and fags and drugs and so on. Now this sounds great because it, it limits the ability of people on welfare to live it up at taxpayers' expense. But the problem is that it concedes the fundamental principle of a social credit system, that the people should only spend on items approved by the state. Okay, now, this sets a really bad precedent. Like for example, why should the limit be 80% and not 100%? And why not apply similar restrictions to other people with bad habits and so on? Because nanny state knows best. The, now, the other digital, the other example is the digital, digital yuan. And this is being rolled out currently nationwide in China. Media attention focuses on comparing it to Bitcoin. I think this is a major mistake. Um, so for example, it doesn't, the digital yuan does not live on a public ledger. It's not a peer-to-peer -peer currency. It's not a crypto. Um, it doesn't have a market valuation independent of the old yuan and so forth. Um, it's controlled by Chinese authorities who can alter and delete anyone's account at will. This is the kind of thing that I was worrying about earlier. Um, the DY offers authorities a new means of surveilling, controlling and punishing anyone. That's on top of the existing social credit or rather it dovetails into it. So it gives total control. Um, so I would say, just my particular view, you might say I'm biased, that this is to be avoided at all costs. It's completely incompatible with a free society. And I put together a few quotes, I'm nearly done. I put together some nice quotes um, in case anybody was interested. Um, Peter Earle says, digital currency may over time morph into nothing less than weaponizable money. Okay. Um, Dominic Frisbee, uh, every transaction ever made will be visible to the all-seeing government. That's a very comforting thought. Uh, Carl Bass, imagine a currency that almost has a mind of its own. It knows your account, it knows your birthday, your social security number, where you live and what you like to buy. And all this knowledge would be sitting in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. And then finally, the motto of the social credit system Keeping trust is glorious and breaking trust is, disgr is disgraceful. Okay. So how do we fight back? Well, I'm basically outlining an agenda here. Um, obvious stuff, recognize what we're dealing with, don't believe them, do your own work, think for yourself. On the freedom versus safety issue, Steve Baker has a delightful uh, Twitter Oh, he says, don't trade liberty for security ever. You will lose both and deserve neither. Um, somebody else that said central bank currencies, digital currencies are creepy fantasy. So conclusions, so it seems to me the benefits to society are zero. The dangers are enormous and really unthinkable. Um, the only issue that matters is the potential of these things to facilitate a reach to total power by our betters, the best in, I think, Plato's term, whose superiority entitles them to rule. What guarantees do we have that 
this wouldn't be abused. Well, none, basically. And that's it. And thank you very much. Kevin, many thanks for a most thought-provoking contribution. Um, just it, one, one of the aspects that, that resonate with me, if I may just mention, uh, we, we hear so much of ransomware attacks and your point uh, as to a single point of failure. I think so far we've been blessed by having uh, the, the very low tech central banks all over the place. We haven't really heard of a central bank hack. And I would surmise even if a central bank was hacked today, it probably wouldn't have many immediately pernicious consequences. But anyways, uh, we, we have the first uh, questions coming in. And uh, I will just uh, summarize the first one that has come in and lob that uh, towards both uh, Jason and uh, Kevin. Uh, that is by Austin Murphy. And uh, it relates to the quantity theory of money, but it's not a technical question as such. Uh, basically, and I hope I summarize that correctly, um, if uh, digital central bank money has the potential of reducing frictions in the system, does that mean uh, that the transaction velocity of money goes up and does that then create inflationary pressure uh, and one should reduce uh, the, the money supply. Um, that reminds me of course uh, of smart contracts but that happen <laughs> instantaneously can be used to, to, to borrow a, a few million and arbitrage and if you don't arbitrage you just give the money back nothing has changed the whole transaction chain is reverted. How do you measure that in terms of transaction velocity? I don't know, 30 milliseconds for the whole thing, but uh, nothing has transacted after all. A anyway, I mean, I, I, maybe if we lob that question first to you, Kevin, uh, is, is uh, uh, central digital money uh, inflationary as such uh, as a result of, of reduced friction? And, and then Jason to you, uh, because uh, a quantity equation rests on established categories and you're suggesting well, these categories actually don't apply uh, to what we're looking at. Kevin, uh, maybe first to you. Okay, so well, I'm a great fan of the quantity theory. So um, yes, I think, whether it's inflation or not depends on how much of it is issued. Um, but what struck me was this quote about um, anti-hoarding, that by putting or threatening to cancel uh, the amount of money in people's uh, accounts, the central bank can very precisely control the amount of spending um, in a way that was never possible before. Um, but the bog standard quantity theory says the, the, the price level, the inflation rate depends on the rate of increase of the money supply. Um, the other point that was raised uh, was about the technical efficiencies uh, and frictions and so on. That's got to be right. And I, I haven't thought all that through by any means. Jason, over to you regarding categories and existing equations we have and whether they would apply at all. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Um, and yes, I, I won't um, purport to, uh, to say much on, on the economic uh, aspects of, of that question. Um, I think certainly from, you know, my legal and uh, I guess regulatory legal perspective, um, you know, there are important changes when we make things sort of bigger, better, faster, stronger. Um, and there's a, a strong rhetoric about, you know, um, you know reducing, <clears throat> reducing friction in transaction flows and so forth. And there are certain, you know, ideas, um, methodological preconceptions and, and, you know, sort of ideas in political economy about the desirability or otherwise. And, uh, um, you know, I remember some interesting debates, you know, back in, back in my uh, days as a doctoral student with, with, with folks who said, well, look, the more we increase transaction flows on the capital markets, the more efficient the market becomes. And so it's excellent. And so all this algorithmic training, uh, algorithmic trading, sorry, is, is exactly what we want because it gives us better price signals. Um, but of course, whether it distortions, you know, in, um, in this system itself, you're, you're just amplifying those distortions, and um, that's potentially raising new, new forms of systemic risk, which I think we should should be very, um, very uh, sort of alert to. Um, in terms of the, the in terms of the categorical arguments, 
obviously our um, our point that central bank money is not really a liability of the central bank. Um, one of the things I love about that argument is there's something for everyone. I've heard people at very different ends of sort of the political economy spectrum um, say, oh, that's a, actually a great idea. Um, and that's that's the nice thing um, about, about this argument. Um, but yeah, obviously it, it, it does tilt the, you know, it changes the, uh, changes the basic terms on which you debate money creation um, and the impacts that that would have, you know, the, the inflation and the money, monetary supply is going to have on, on the real economy and on people. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it for there. Thanks, thanks, Jason. Um, in relation to that particular question, I'm reminded, of course, to what happens in decentralized finance at the moment uh, yeah. with the whole concept of, of staking, which, which bypasses a banking system uh, and, and would, would, would those who use that uh, uh, to, to simply, I mean, they, you could, could explode the quantity of money in, in, in no time, uh, in, in, in a few seconds, and then uh, collapse it again, um, just by having collateral in one currency to borrow another currency and, and then invest or, or or, uh, arbitrage with that. Um, we will have to see if that scales up and whether it has uh, consequences that can be felt in the wider economy. At the moment, it doesn't translate uh, uh, into, into the real economy or into the traditional monetary economy uh, to any significant extent. Uh, we have the first rounds of praise coming in. If I may just uh, honestly quote one, um, thanks so much to for unbuilding a great deal of wrong, <laughs> in particular in relation to, to Kevin's presentation. Uh, so cheers, cheers to that. Um, please do keep uh, the questions uh, coming in uh, and I will read them out. Uh, and, and while we reflect on your questions and contributions to the discussion, uh, might I just um, also uh, try one of my thoughts on both of you, Kevin and, and Jason. We talk about uh, digital money, uh, central bank digital money. For some reason, that discussion has been triggered by cryptocurrencies. Now, we do not seem to talk about any of the key parameters of, of cryptocurrencies in, in, in our uh, debate at all. Um, so we do not talk about smart contracts. We do not talk about a distributed ledger. We do not talk about a trustless system. Uh, we do not talk about the blockchain. We do not talk about cryptography at all. So, so all the key concepts at the moment that exercise uh, the crypto bros, uh, if I may use that term, mm -hmm. doesn't seem to exercise the monetary policy bros. And I'm slightly puzzled by that, or maybe I should not. Um, Kevin, Jason, what's your reaction to that? No, I can offer something. I mean, the only commonality I can see is that they're both digital. And they're both money. Or, or if you would grant that, uh, that crypto is money, let's say we do. It's another issue. I don't see any other similarity. Jason? You know, I think from my perspective, coming from several years now of um, pretty intentional and concerted engagement with um, you know, the concepts and categories within the, you know, the new sort of DLT based, um, uh, you know, financial uh, services ecosystem that's, that, that's growing. Um, it, it, it may be just a, uh, a function of the fact that they've been parallel conversations for several years. Um, the crypto bros uh, have said, your system is, uh, is bollocks, frankly, and um, we want to supersede it and we want to sort of bypass it. And, you know, when I was, uh, you know, a postdoc a few years ago, uh, interested in, you know, the impacts of emerging tech, including and especially, you know, cryptocurrencies on, on monetary law and on legal ideas and conceptions of money, um, uh, there was there was a fair degree of so sort of circumspection and and even dismissal and oh, it's a flash in the pan. So I think you know conversations occurred in parallel for quite a while, and it's in the last probably two or three years that those um, those conversations have been you know sort of joining up. Um, and yeah, there's been perhaps a degree of you know uh, conceit in terms of, you know, in incumbent monetary theory and also in terms of, you know, the Bitcoin maximalist who thinks 
is basically reinventing the wheel and thinks that law can go out and you know um, these sort of incumbent institutions are all are all um, you know almost wholly a bad thing. Um, I think we're seeing more of a more of a a, a joining up of those dots. Um, you know, I know that BLT, for example, especially on a permissioned ledger basis, is one you know pretty plausible design approach for a CBDC. Um, and there are you know consortia who are you know de- working on 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 such uh, infrastructures and you know doing their best to convince central banks that this is this is the way to go. Um, you know. <laughs> Do, do these, uh, I guess the question is how much do, um, you know, ideas like the ones you mentioned impact on our concept of, of money and on monetary policy, um, you know, and do they do so at the conceptual level or at the policy tool level? Um, hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can I, thanks, Jason, for your, uh, Kevin, you wanted to come in on that? Well, I just wanted to, I'm sorry, Jason, I didn't mean to cut across you. I hope I uh, didn't come across that way. But um, I was just going to go, go back to um, Matthias. And the, it struck me that the, the level of public understanding of these things is so low that it's kind of natural that when China launches a digital currency, people go turn around and say, well, how does it compare to Bitcoin? And that shows you how low that understanding is. And I must say that my level of technical expertise is microscopic. So I can well understand that, you know, the, the, the vast amount of misunderstanding out there because I'm part of it myself. Okay, well, th- thanks for that. I think that, that is a, a very interesting point because my own experience uh, in, in research in FinTech is uh, the discussions in the industries change so quickly uh, yeah, yeah. That, that academics struggle conceptually because it takes us five years to publish a paper <laughs> and that starts an academic debate. Uh, we might have some workshops before. So our production pipeline is, is very, very slow, even compared to conventional industries and in the fintech industries. I mean, they, they change every few months. Uh, so, so even in the, the traditional fintech sector, uh, crowdfunding, uh, even microfinance, digital microfinance, uh, that was alive well, 20 years ago. Um, it, it took some years for academics to start thinking about what that meant. Uh, regarding crowdfunding, there are not many people in that space uh, publishing on a regular basis uh, because uh, the, the categories change, the companies you wanted to, to look at disappear, there's no data available. Now, when it comes to uh, anything uh, blockchain related, I, I, access already is a significant issue. I mean, I could just ask around how many people in this room have have invested via smart contracts in Ethereum. Uh, would be an interesting question. Maybe some have invested into Bitcoin or just looked at it. How does that actually work? Um, but in order to study it, you have, you have to be engaged with it. Um, now, and that does not even touch on the policy question. Uh, so so oh. until you have structured discussions in the policy sphere, that, that will even take take longer. So do we actually have hope to structurally reflect uh, on those innovations? Um, but I'm consoled by both of you uh, in a way, because uh, uh, what you've described both of you in, in, in the discussion just now is that, that the two spheres are, are by now maybe touching, but are not intersecting, certainly uh, regarding monetary policy. Um, uh, the digital developments happen sui generis in, in their own ways uh, with, without uh, trying to, to necessarily engage uh, with uh, blockchain developments, uh, decentralized finance, unless, unless it becomes a regulatory question uh, and one needs to control activity that gets in the way uh, of, of the traditional economy. Now, um, let me catch up on questions that have been coming in. I had one question. Um, Oh, that, that has disappeared, but I just see it has popped up again. I will read that while I pose the other question to you. And that is from Juan Castaneda. And that is a question for Jason. Uh, on the policy implications of your paper, why would central bank money be less inflationary? Um, I, I fear I'm, uh, I'm not going to give a very satisfactory answer here because it is, it is much more within the remit. Um, of my, my co-author. 
Um, I um, I know that in in the uh, in the final pages, and I guess I'd refer Juan to the final pages, like page 36, 37 of, of the paper. The, this was also a point of discussion that we had when we presented this um, at a uh, at a seminar with IMF uh, member central bankers. Um, we we do draw distinctions between central banks in sort of developed economies with with a reserve currency um, and central banks in in uh, in less developed um, economies with with weaker currencies. Um, and uh, I, I think I think we do argue that under certain circumstances, particularly in the former group, um, central bank uh, money issuance is less inflationary um, than it would it would seem, you know, from first principles, uh, or at least the inflationary impact of an increased central bank balance sheet would hit later. I think it's obvious that, you know, a large increase of central bank money circulating in the economy is, is going to be inflationary at some point. Um, that, that's, that's my understanding of it. And it's not my understanding that we're arguing that, you know, central bank money is per se, um, you know, never inflationary if you understand that it's, that it's not a debt of the government. Um, uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd refer to those pages, and we can we can gladly sort of follow those up. And I, I would say you'd, you'd get a, a much more satisfactory answer from uh, from from my co-author Michael. Thank you, Jason. Um, I have now two questions by Jared Lyons. Uh, I first uh, present you the first question, and that is one uh, specifically directed towards you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, in the light of your presentation, what are your views about the implications of CBDC for central bank independence? Oh, a good question. Um, I've never been a great fan of central bank independence issue because I've always felt that central banks were always were given some independence on a leash. But in the end, it, uh, fiscal needs would always trump um, monetary policy. So, so the government allows the central bank a freedom of manoeuvre, which it can withdraw at will. Um, so from, only from a sort of minor, let's say, institutional point of view of how monetary policy operates, like does the chancellor set interest rates, does the M MPC set interest rates? Those issues matter in, for certain questions, but in the broader scheme of things, I, I think this is a, a, a secondary issue. And I'm mindful of the fact that recent, uh, there have been recent revelations where the government was thinking of revoking uh, the quote unquote independence of the central bank at the height of the COVID crisis. So it could go just like that. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Good question, though. And I, I, I need to think more about it, to be honest. Jared's second question, uh, if I may, um, now to both speakers. Um, how credible would it be if, if all the central banks uh, would write off the debt they hold? Uh, and if they acted together, uh, and that is in the context of, of digital central bank money, if I understand the question well, uh, would that help lessen the angst towards such a step? Yeah, so, so what's the whole question of, of debt right off? Uh, maybe, Jason, if you start with you, because you're skeptical regarding the whole question of liability, uh, how, how do we approach uh, uh, writing off debt uh, if the uh, yeah. in that context? I mean, that, that was going to be my, my question. What, what, what category of debt are we talking about? And what, uh, yeah, what, what debt's held by governments in, in what way? Um, so debts of others that the government holds or... Well, I, I would I would suspect, uh, as uh, to the extent that central banks are involved, uh, then you, you might have a skeptical attitudes towards liability. But but if uh, there is debt, there is a contract or an arrangement behind it. Uh, so, so what would be the implication? Um, uh, you probably would say maybe you you could just uh, proceed with writing off because uh, the 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 sui generous nature of central bank money uh, would would not be greatly be affected. You could just uh, 
through a number of the steps that you'd outline, when quantitative easing, in a way, could be a case study uh, in allowing that. I'm, I'm in a way, uh, reciting M -A MMT in this context, of course. Uh, does the opposition, uh, Jason, lend support to that? Um, one, of the, one of the discussions we have in, in the paper is on the MMT point, and we, um, we do criticise the tendency in the MMT literature to um, elide central bank money and other categories of government debt. Um, I suppose coming from the legal perspective, the central bank, um, you know, is, is independent in a lot of op operational sense. It is, you know, part of the government, even in, in situations where the central bank is, is, is you know, its, it's shareholders, not necessarily the, the, the chancellor or the exchequer or whatever. Um, and it may, it may be privately owned, but it is, it is at least sort of a, a quasi public, public institution. Um, but in any case, it's constituted as a separate legal entity and whatever debts it holds or what are the debts of others that it holds as, as its assets on its, uh, on its balance sheets, we argue should be seen distinctly from, you know, the consolidated debt of, of Trevor, Treasury or, or uh, you know, consol the consolidated revenue fund, whatever it's called in, in the relevant jurisdiction. So it may be I'm looking nonplus because that's, that's not a... Not something I've, I've directed my mind to a lot, or I've maybe misunderstood the question. In broad terms, um, you know, probably being a bit uh, pink under the collar, I, I think that, um, you know, debt forgiveness is, is a very serious question that we should ask. You know, when we allow, uh, you know, private parties to create money in the broad money sense and expand the money supply, through their contractual dealings. And as you said, through algorithmic actions, the money supply is now fluctuating, you know, the broad money supply is fluctuating on a millisecond basis. Um, and the financial economy is, is eclipsing, you know, the real economy, um, however you define those two things, uh, you know, sometimes absurdly, um, I think, yeah, debt forgiveness is, is, a, is a, a conversation we should definitely have. Um, and I think that in terms of, you know, for my sins, I was a constitutional lawyer before I, before I became, uh, you know, I restyled myself as monetary lawyer. And, um, you know, debts held by the organs of the body, body politic, um, you know, I, I could see that there would be legitimate reasons for those, those debts to be, you know, written off or annulled, you know, through some exercise of, of sovereign authority. That's, that's, you know. can, I, can I come in there? I, I totally Kevin, agree with that. Yeah, over to you, Kevin. I'm oh, sorry, uh, I totally agree with that. But here's how I would approach it. First off, I think it's a great question. I wasn't entirely sure what that Jared was referring to. So here's how I would tackle the question. I, I would always think of going back to first principles, and a lawyer perhaps would be horrified by this, but I would see the central bank and the government in terms of a consolidated government balance sheet, because for, of, let's say, first principles basis, the central bank is part of the government writ large. So then I would channel the discussion through that consolidated government cent uh, balance sheet, and the answer would perhaps come out of that, or part of the answer would come out of that. I, I guess to the extent that, you know, so much of QE concerns precisely government debt, um, yeah. you know, that, that all becomes a little bit difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I probably to, yeah. you know, an area of theory where, yeah, we need to need to shine some more light. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm putting you on on standby just in case the stream of questions, uh, is, is coming to, to its, uh, conclusion now, um, I have one more question from, from my side, and that relates to the whole, the whole issue of different discourses that we have. Uh, I, I think the technological di dimension was notably absent today, uh, but I think for good reasons, as the discussion has, has established. If I go to industry events, um, if I go to the cryptocurrency community, I find a, 
a completely different discussion. But I find a discussion about the same issues, but with categories, but that community crafts itself. So code is law, right? Smart contracts are algorithms. They have their own courts. So they adjudicate about these issues uh, that are put uh, in an almost legalistic fashion. They're resolved before they come to, to the traditional legal system in their own categories. They have their own economics. So the whole question of gold standard that popped up suddenly and, and, and this kind of wishful thinking of what the gold standard was or could be and how that relates to, <laughs> to, to distributed ledgers and blockchains. Uh, but, th but these categories are being developed by engineers. And, and it reminds me of where economics comes from. Economics has been developed by engineers. So the, the beautiful theory of general equilibrium comes from French engineers in many respects. And uh, it took the rest of society a good, good while to catch up with that. Might we see something like that? Have you, uh, Kevin and, and Jason, experience with talking to that other community? Have you got plans to do that? Uh, or are we really in these two worlds and we should just stick to monetary policy um, and, and, and talk to central banks and, and let's just wait what happens in the technological sector? Can I just, I'll give a very quick answer. Um, I do believe we should reach out and talk to people. Um, but I have to say that when I tried to do that with the Bitcoiners, I got pretty badly burnt. And so I generally uh, don't bother anymore. Occasionally, I'll just stick up something in the hornet's nest and see what comes out. But by and large, yes, I think we should talk. Yes, right. Jason? Yeah, look, definitely. I mean, that's, that's something I think is, is hugely important. Um, you know, <laughs> Yeah, dealing with, with sort of Bitcoin maxis, we might say, you know, um, it can, can be a bit like that. There are, there are you know, fairly, um, fairly strong ideological underpinnings, you know, to aspects of, of the crypto movement. And, um, you know, even folks who, uh, you know, even folks who you think would be birds of a feather. I mean, I, I remember also reading recently in, a, in an article by an Austrian economist that, you know, they were similarly rebuffed at a, bit, at a Bitcoin conference, you know, some years ago. The, the thing is, I think we are squarely moving into the age of pragmatic crypto. And I think that there is much, much more intentional engagement and cross-pollination going on. I got interested in this whole area of law and law and technology really as a result of conversations with engineers, you know, software and other um, where I found at a certain point I was enjoying talking about law with them more than with some of my, um, my you know, uh, fellow, fellow legal scholars. Um, there is a different vocabulary. There is a different, um, you know, there are high transaction costs in terms of establishing what are we actually talking about. We're describing, you know, a, pro a problem or a concept or an idea differently, but perhaps there's, you know, there's, there's an underlying kind of commonality here. Um, you know, the strict kind of um, this, you know, the techno libertarian, this takes part in cyberspace and cyberspace is apart from the world of law, you know, I think is facile, is naive and is increasingly untenable. I think that also it's a position from which, you know, people are defecting. Um, they're tasting, uh, you know, they're, they're tasting what it's like also to participate in, you know, in the mainstream sort of uh, economy. And there are very, very interesting debates going on um, in terms of how to translate, you know, legal norms into code, but also how to translate code, for example, industry generated norms into, you know, regulation. I think in my experience, so many regulators are actually quite open-minded. Um, I think much more so than, you know, again, the, the sort of prototypical Bitcoin maxi would be. Like there's been no really huge uh, resistance to these, these developments. Um, you know, it's kind of like banging on, on, an open, on an open door to an extent. There's, you know, I'm part of groups where we're, spending a lot of time trying to work out, you know, the property status of Bitcoins, like, or, uh, you know, how you can encumber these in terms of, you know, granting security rights over them or creating a trust over crypto assets. Um, in terms of the plug, you know, uh, there's a book forthcoming by myself and, and, and Peter Hunt 
at the end of the year on the idea of smart legal contracts and on computational law, which was, again, the call was specifically extended to computer scientists as well as lawyers to say, look, you know, there's this rhetoric about these smart contracts being a functional equivalent to law, which never touches the universe, sort of the, the legal universe, the universe of legal rights. But we're much more interested in the ones that, that, that sort of do. Um, intentionally or unintentionally. And I think that's, that's whether you call it, you know, crypto law or, or otherwise, it's a really burgeoning field. And I think it will be a really exciting field for doctrinal law, but also legal theory over the next, um, the next sort of decade. Well, um, yeah. I was just saying good luck with your book, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. On this very high note, uh, I suggest uh, we come to the end of proceedings of this session. Uh, luckily, both with uh, the promise of a fascinating book uh, by Jason and, of course, uh, the Umeus blog uh, by Kevin, which I again direct uh, your attention to. Um, and um, thanks to the audience as well for, for fascinating questions that helped us have a, a great discussion on these various issues and uh, Yuan uh, I hand uh, the word over to you now. Well thank you very much uh, Matthias for chairing the session and indeed to our to our speakers to, to Jason and Kevin for their contributions I very much appreciate them. Uh, I have certainly learned uh, a lot today especially about uh, uh, not just digital currencies but specifically central bank digital currencies and I need to learn much more about it. Um, so not just uh, to yourselves, uh, the, the contributors and the chair of session two, but also to my colleagues uh, who have uh, presented uh, earlier today in session one, uh, to David, uh, Brandon, and to, to Chris, uh, the chair of the session. Um, I'm very thankful, and indeed, uh, Diego Zuluaga, that I was forgot forgetting. Uh, uh, thank you all very much for participating today. You have been very generous with your time. Uh, I only wish that we can do it uh, uh, again next time, hopefully here in Buckingham, face to face. Uh, but again, thank you all very much. I may just uh, uh, end today's uh, uh, proceedings, just reminding that uh, the IMR is very much involved in the teaching, in the delivery of two postgraduate programs uh, that very much uh, focus on some of the topics we have uh, discussed today, on money, new means of payments, monetary policies, et cetera. Uh, these postgraduate programs are um, hosted and delivered uh, by the University of Buckingham the master's and the postgraduate certificate in money banking and central banking. And we have also started from the Institute, uh, uh, the offer of online courses in money, banking, and an introduction to monetarism. And next uh, uh, autumn, we're going to launch a new online course on new means of payments. Just in case you were interested, you can visit our website, www.mv-pt.org and find more information about it. And indeed, you can visit our website uh, to learn more about the two uh, forthcoming events we're going to have in the, in the summer, two new, uh, two more uh, webinars, and also about the public lecture and the, the uh, conference, the annual conference that we'll be hosting in the, in the autumn. You will find more details on our website. So again, thank you all very much to the contributors, to the chairs, to my colleagues for the excellent organization of this uh, event and also uh, indeed to all the, the viewers from home. Thank you very much. Thank you.